Jarin? Siapa saya? Jarin. Hai Jarin. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear you? Okay, yeah, but thank you very well. You are faint on my side. Uh, the, the, the time it's it's nine o'clock. Can we start? Yes, sir, President, we can start. Okay. Uh, good morning, honorable members. Um, good morning, Kate. Recording uh, in progress. Good uh, good morning, and you are, you are all welcome. Uh, support staff of the Standing Committee on Appropriations, um, members of the public, uh, members of the media, and uh, the National Treasury uh, officials. And I'm not sure if there is a, 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 a minister of the who's there today, but you'll see who's leading the National Treasury team. Good morning, all of you, and you're all welcome. Um, no, I'm here, Chair. David Masonda. Oh, DM, uh, good, good morning, DM, and uh, you're most welcome. Um, we, 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 we have uh, <coughs> a national treasure uh, 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 today, and uh, they'll be taking us on, in, on a number of things. Uh, mainly, we know that uh, we, we have said most of the problems that we are having uh, won't be able to to deal with them if the economy of this country is, is not is not working, so they'll be taking us through some of their initiatives uh, on uh, ERRP, economic reconstruction and recovery plan, as pronounced by the president. Um, Operation Budin um, <clears throat> You also know that uh, um, they've been in, engaged in a process of uh, um, uh, <clears throat> budget consolidation. Um, and many issues have been raised around that, but I think the, 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 the committee said they would like to hear in what are the implications of that and how far are we going with the process? Uh, because uh, I think we are coming from that it has got its own limitations. So it's very important that as, as, as the committee also understand that. Yeah, so that's uh, basically why we are, we are, we are having a team national treasure today uh, led by uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister Masondo. <clears throat> Darren, do you have any apologies? Yes, Chairperson, we received an apology from Mr. Kwankwa, and then Mr. Uh, our content advisor, Mr. Magagula, is not is not well today. So that only apology. Yeah, and and an another uh, <clears throat> uh, I received an apology from Honorable Kaiso. There's an emergency that he had to attend to at home. So he's uh, either flying or driving back to uh, from Cape Town to uh, to the Free State. <clears throat> um, that's fine. And then uh, we, we'll take that presentation and uh, we'll, 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 we'll give Team Trajan about an hour for presentations. And then we'll engage with, the, with their presentation. And then after that, we'll, have, uh, we'll be having some, some, some announcements and then we'll, we'll close. <clears throat> I think that's, uh, that's uh, the, the brief of today's meeting, honorable members. Uh, honorable DM, can we hand over to you and your team to take us through your uh, presentation? And thank you very much. DM. Thanks, DM. Chair. Oh. Yes, I can hear you. Um, yeah. th thanks for this opportunity for us to present um, progress on some of the things or work that we are doing. And uh, thank you to, uh, uh, to honorable members and the members of the public, the media present today, uh, national treasury officials. Um, so, the ERP, uh, Economic Recovery Plan, which you expect us to say something on it, uh, Chair and then Honorable Members, it's largely the program led by the, by the President. Of course, we are involved in it. And um, <clears throat> our main task, amongst other things, it's around facilitation 
of the structural reforms under the Operation Vulindlela, which is an initiative between ourselves as National Treasury and the President. And you recall that um, the structural reforms is one of the priorities that the President has articulated in the State of uh, Nation Address uh, which he presented in 2021, uh, Feb, uh, this year. And the objective really of, of this uh, Operation Vulindela is to deal with the structural reforms, to unlock the supply side constraints um, on our economy, uh, because we, we all know that our economy has not been growing since the 28, 2008 global economic crisis. And COVID has made it worse. And the recent unrest, they've also made um, our economic situation worse. And I think uh, our role largely in facilitating this uh, structural reform is just to unlock the supply side uh, of our economy in order to grow um, our economy. And the fact that uh, unemployment is also going, uh, it's, it's, it's increasing, it becomes more urgent that we really focus our energies in growing uh, our economy. And like I said, the supply side uh, of our economy has uh, <clears throat> made it difficult for our economy to grow at the pace at which we can absorb uh, more people into uh, employment. We can set the material basis for uh, tax revenue because we can only generate adequate tax revenue if the economy is not growing. So our economy has not been growing because um, we've not been able to supply reliable, uh, consistent, and affordable electricity, not only to households, but also to businesses. Uh, the supply of skills, telecommunication, water. And my team, um, that is um, uh, Dr. Sean, as well as Duncan, they will provide some progress, Chair, to yourselves and your committee on how far we are in implementing these structural reforms. And you'll be pleased to know that uh, amongst other things that we've been able to push together with the president is the raising of the licensing threshold for self-generation to 100 uh, megawatts. There are still some challenges in certain areas like telecommunication, in which we thought that we'll make some progress. Unfortunately, we were delayed by the court uh, processes because other actors were not happy with the process. They took us to court. And we are trying to have a conversation with the actors in this area to make sure that we resolve these issues out of court so that we don't delay the process further. Um, on water, there are things that we are doing with the Department of Water um, Affairs. And, and amongst other things that the president has announced uh, to the nation is that we need to reduce the turnaround time for the approval of the licenses from almost a year to 90 days. And we have engaging or we are engaging with the Department of Water Affairs to just improve the business processes, re-engineer the process so that it uh, it's faster for these licenses to be approved. And we've done some work in that regard and the team would report on how far we, we've, we, we've gone in that regard. And I must indicate Chair, that we don't implement these reforms ourselves as national treasury. In other words, we're not implementing uh, agencies, departments of these reforms. There are uh, reform implementers and it's largely the departments that are assigned to deal with these reforms, e.g. Department of Minerals and Energy, Telecommunications, on water, it's water skills. There's a work which is being done between the Department of Home Affairs and the Department of, of Higher Education in that regard. So we don't necessarily, we don't implement. We, what we do is to facilitate the um, implementation of those reforms by way of asking questions, by way of uh, providing support to the departments to make sure that they do implement uh, these reforms by way of enabling and empowering the president to um, have conversations uh, with the responsible uh, department. And therefore, we will really appreciate that uh, we work together to make sure that uh, these departments 
and entities that are responsible for implementing these reforms um, are held to account, are asked questions, and if they do need support, all of us as a parliament, as a Operation Vulindlela, uh, as well as the civil society, because we do work with civil society, particularly business as well as labor, in uh, making sure that we work together to um, uh, unlock the potential of our economy by dealing with the constraints, supply side constraints that um, uh, a block uh, or an impediment for um, our economic growth. So we're looking forward, Chair, to uh, an engagement and also guidance on how we can work together to make sure that we accelerate the uh, structural reforms to grow um, our economy. And I will ask the National Treasury team to um, start with the uh, presentations. And I'm not so sure between yourself, Duncan, and uh, Sean, who is going to start, because I'm, I'm aware that uh, I've seen the presentations. We've got very uh, well-prepared uh, presentations for this committee's uh, consideration, as well as uh, guidance. Uh, Dr. Sean. Uh, no, DM. Um, uh, oh, DG. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, no, sorry. I, I, I didn't notice that you, 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 you joined us. Um, thanks for um, uh, DG uh, for, for, for being here. Uh, DG as well, I think he will guide us on how we are going to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, present uh, progress on, on these areas because uh, in the final analysis, the DG is, also, is responsible for technical support, administrative support and leadership uh, in this regard. So he's put together his team. Uh, let me hand over to the DG to um, uh, lead us insofar as these uh, uh, presentations are concerned. Over to you, DG, and thank you, Chair. Good morning. Uh Good morning, honorable members, and good morning, Deputy Minister. Thank you for the opportunity that you gave us to appear before this committee. Um, we, 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 we really appreciate this. Um, I'm on, and I'm also with, uh, you know, Vuyo, one of the chief directors. Unfortunately, Dr. Peter and other colleagues that would normally be participating in this conversation are also in other... Uh, you know, committees currently as we speak, um, you know, um, there's a fiscal responsibility bill that's been looked at and Edgar is there and there are other commitments. So apologies on their behalf, but we, we are we are here and we are ready to to present to, to the committee. Uh, I don't know if the Secretariat is going to fly the presentation. Um, uh, you know, we'll appreciate if they do that at this point. Um, and thank you very much. Can I just double check if the Secretariat is sliding? Erin? Chairperson, yes, yes. Um, I made a mistake. I made Mr. Mogadzana uh, uh, the host. He, he must just make me a co-host. I don't know what, what I did. Uh, the DG is the current leader, so I can't, I can't share my screen. He's supposed is to it make... Maybe I can share it. Let's see if it's going to be possible. Um, my computer skills are not good, but we'll try. Uh, are you teaching? Uh, How are you? I'm, I'm very well, Chair. I'm very well. And I hope the, my computer skills are showing now that... Yes, we, yes, we, we can see it. Yes. No, thanks. Just, just take it to slideshow. Is yeah, that okay, sir? Yeah, perfect. No, th thank you very much. Yes. Uh, you know, we, we, we obviously wanting to talk to the committee around key budget issues and leading into the ERRP and our contribution, our understanding, Chair, when we were checking with you was that, you know, uh, you know, we will, we will, of course, have to talk about treasuries as a unit within the government system 
and the role they're playing in the ERRP. So we will try and highlight that. Yeah. And Dr. Shil Phillips will at the end complement what I'll say with progress that we are overlooking as a treasury joint with the president on bullying Lela and the operations thereof. So I'll start by just key points that are critical for the committee to know that, and, and there are limitations, and, and I hope the committee understands this, there are limitations in terms of how far we can go with some of the information into moving into what we need to be doing, because as, 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 as you may be aware, Chair and others, the information, you know, there's some market sensitive information, and, and we've been disciplined in the last 20 or so years to only talk about, uh, you know, estimates and projections uh, around the MTBPS and around the budget. So, and then the market expects that. So, so if we if if we break that cycle, we, we can upset uh, how we are priced in the market. And we, we are very careful not to not to not to play in that because many a speculator out there can start speculating about our borrowing needs, our requirements, etc. So we played very safe. That's why you will see or hear us only talking about the outcomes in terms of budget performance and the budget. And then we can only then start talking about the adjusted budget once we've passed this. So as things are currently, Chair, um, the outcomes for 2021 financial year show a budget deficit of 11% of GDP or about 552 billion. And, and uh, you know, this is these are the estimates as we as we see them as we as, as we have seen them now, uh, compared to what we've said at the time of the 2021 budget. So, it shows a deficit of 11 percent, and there's also high government spending, four percent above inflation for almost a decade that we've seen, and and higher debt, um, and all of these fail to lift growth. We are, you know, what we owe people. We are way above emerging market average by almost 15%. So our debt situation is above the rest or economic sizes, uh, or you know, countries, our economic size, we are 15% above that. There's also a need, and we did say, by the way, it's important that and Deputy Minister mentioned this, structural reforms that we are looking like box and that Operation Bulindala is all about and that Sean will speak to later on are essential for growth and to increase the momentum in order for us to uh, be within respectable deficits and also be able to manage our debt moving forward uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, carefully. Therefore, it becomes very necessary uh, for us to continue on a fiscal consolidation trajectory, at least for now, uh, uh, in order for us to avoid a debt or fiscal crisis. And, and so that's something that I think we are doing and then we, we, we continue doing until our situation changes. Uh, and that basically tells you that um, our expenditure should be guarded vis-a-vis -vis the amount of debt that we can take on, including avoiding a fiscal crisis if it has to emerge. Now, what this slide basically shows, uh, uh, Chair, is, is uh, uh, as I said, preliminary outcomes for, 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 for the current year. And, and, and we're saying that they are, they are worse than the 2020 budget estimates. Uh, and that's what I was trying to say earlier on. So our situation has become worse. Um, the 2021 preliminary outcomes show that GDP, 19 pandemic on the public finance and the economy. We have seen the impact of COVID last year um, and, and, and the performance of the economy and so as a result, the situation is much worse than what it was then. Nevertheless, even if we're looking at it like that, the performance are slightly better than expected in the 2021, 2021 budget. And compared to the 2020 budget estimates, the main budget deficit was worse um, than expected by almost 4.2% points of GDP. The point of departure for fiscal policy is from this weakened and vulnerable position. We're saying that as we approach, uh, you know, as we go to the fiscal, um, you know, MTBBS, this slide becomes necessary and the implications of what this slide means for our debt situation and for our financial situation becomes, becomes necessary to look at. Our fiscal position chair remains negative in the global context if you look where we are at and, and we took some of the, uh, you know, 
World Economic Outlook, uh, you know, estimates uh, from the IMF, um, where if you look at South Africa and where our primary balance is compared to other countries in the same space that we are in, we are not in a good position. You can see, ideally, the primary balance should be zero. If, you know, um, you know, then your ability to repay debt, obviously, is uh, to an extent, a primary balance is used to actually uh, evaluate or determine your, your ability to pay debt. Again, if you look at projected three-year increase in debt, we are leading the pack, uh, which is not an ideal situation. It's in a bad situation and we don't wanna be there. We actually wanna be right at the bottom where Egypt or even Pakistan is. Uh, so this is, this is worrying chair in terms of where we are at. And in comparison with the wide range of developing countries, I said, is, 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 we, we fall in the middle. South Africa's three-year debt is among the largest in the world. Fiscal distress is mounting in many countries. And this environment is making South Africa to actually be in a very worse situation, as I said. So again, uh, as we approach the MTBPS, this is a, a scenario and a picture that we have to continue looking at and, and be worried about. Now, this slide is familiar with the committee and it's a slide and these are graphs that we normally show in our budget. Um, you know, as much as we say in the main budget, primary DP is projected to narrow over the medium term gross uh, to 88.9%, the challenges on the ground makes obviously almost that impossible. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, let me focus on the, on the, on the uh, you know, slide, I mean, the, the graph on the left. Look at the 10 year period from 2006 to 2016, and also look at 2016 to date in terms of, I mean, to, to, to projections that we are putting in 2023. Our main budget non interest expenditure, which is the red line, is something that we should be looking at. In 2006, 2007, you can see the red line was below the black line meaning we were collecting more than what we are spending at the time. And at the time, we were running huge deficits as a country. In 2007, 2008, the global financial crisis hit, and you can see that black line declining. And what did we do with expenditure? Expenditure began to increase. The programs that we would have set three years before 2006 we're slowing an increase in expenditure. And if you, if you remember, Chair, it is the, the period, it was the good years for South Africa. These were the periods when we were ramping up our expenditure. Our child support grant was increasing. Those years we're giving far more than, uh, you know, salary increases uh, that were above average at the time. Things were doing, were, everything was good for South Africa before 2006, 2007. We had enough money to expand on programs. We took more EPW programs, community works development programs. We ramped our expenditure in a big way. And we can go back into those details of those years and see what exactly did you do, do. Even approaching that, we are ramping up on our, on, our, on our 2010 program, World Cup program. After the announcement, improvements of road networks, increase to province in terms of what they needed to do. But when global financial crisis hit, our expenditures, we did not re re reverse what essentially was good uh, government spending at the time. Revenue dropped in that particular year, almost 70, 80 billion, if I remember. And it then took us time. We have never ever recovered from the highs of 2007-2008, we only managed to do that in 1920, but still our expenditure was still high. And it is for that reason, and the peaks that you see in expenditure, by the way, the peaks that you see in expenditure can also be informed, especially in 2011-2012, and again in 2017-2018, you'll remember that the fees must fall campaign when we provided free education, our expenditure increased. Again, at the same time, we, you know, salary increases at the time in 2017, the previous round, including many other types of expenditures. Our revenue performance, the economy is not doing well. 
What then do we do, uh, uh, honorable members, when revenue is less than expenditure? It means your borrowing needs and requirements increase. It then means your debt increases. That's why in 2012, 2013, you will remember, we started talking about haircuts across the system, trying to cut expenditure. We're not very successful, but we were doing embarking on a, on a cutting, a revenue cutting exercise, including what we've been talking about now. The previous Minister of Finance, you may have heard him talking about the mouth of the hippopotamus going wide. That's what he meant with the 1920 financial year, where continuously non-interest spending increases and continuously um, main budget revenue decreases, whereas as a result of COVID in the last year or so. So the challenge remains, how do we close the gap? And that's where, that's where uh, you know, fiscal consolidation becomes necessary. And that's where we say, this uh, situation is untenable. We have to do something about it. The graph on the right basically says the same story, but puts it different and it only looks at our gross debt to GDP. And again, in 26 to 007, our debt to GDP was almost 25, 26%. We managed to control it up to that point. It has been increasing. If you look at our previous budget documentation, we'll keep on saying we wanted to stabilize at a number. At some point in 2018, 2017, 2018, we wanted it to stabilize at 50% debt to GDP. We are not successful. It keeps on increasing because of the non-performance of the economy. And that's why then structural reform becomes necessary in that way. So what we said at the time of the 2020 MTBPS, we gave that scenario, we revised that down at the time of the budget to a lower, uh, you know, revised uh, debt to GDP, um, you know, where we, it's peaking at 88.9%. And we hope we through our fiscal consolidation program that will increase. So any new pressure on the expenditure side can push this debt to GDP up, which is not ideal. And also, and the mouth of the hippopotamus will actually uh, be wider and wider on the day. So what then is our fiscal strategy, Chair? Uh, our strategy, strategy remains to balance the immediate need uh, for support uh, you know, to the economy during the pandemic with ongoing efforts to close a large pre-existing budget deficit. And in this context, our fiscal strategy therefore remains uh, or aims to narrow the deficit and stabilize the debt to GDP ratio, as I said, primarily by controlling non-interest expenditure. That's what we've been saying. That's what, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, currently our, our position is. We will continue providing sub continued support to the economy and public health service in the short term um, without adding to long-term spending pressures. If we can do this, then we are on a good uh, footing. And obviously we want to continue to improve in the composition of spending and ensuring that we spend money on productive sectors of the economy vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, just maybe just consumption. Um, significant risks remain um, and, you know, uh, globally, the global outlook is uncertain, Chair, and, and with the economic recovery largely dependent on responses to COVID-19, we clearly can see that we cannot say we are out of uh, the woods as things are. Several state-owned companies are requesting additional funding. You know that, and it's a challenge. Denel remains a challenge, uh, you know, and, and others. SAPO, um, uh, uh, just, just as an example, you, you, you know. And also, and also what is currently a topical item in South Africa, around the wage uh, agreements and the risks uh, that you know, finally have materialized now. And one just hopes that you know, uh, you know, we, we will approach this very carefully. And this is what we'll continue saying, Chair, and saying it's important, we, it's not ideal. It's not ideal uh, to, 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 to not give inflation increases. It's not ideal for wages, but the reality is that we come to that conclusion because of exactly this. And I'm not you know, further justifying what I've, what I've said in the affidavit that we, we put out in the court as we engage with way we labor on these things. We outlined in, 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 a, in, a, in very much detail the challenges on the wage front. 
And I'm not in any way suggesting any other thing other than saying there are and there should be areas where we can, uh, you know, slow down the wage growth vis-a-vis -vis the performance of the economy. The current wage agreement will cost around 20 billion. And it, it, we, we did one at the time of the budget. Uh, if, 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 if we are not going to have a flat increase or a flat, uh, a, you, know, uh, you know, approach to wage. So as we say, it has materialized. So 20 billion is what we have to continuously look for. And this amount is over and above the compensation ceiling tabled in February. And we've been, we did indicate in the 21 budget review that this will have a significant impact. Um, so we, we are trying to do work currently, Chair, in terms of how to address this wage agreement within the current constrained environment where uh, economy is not growing. And on, on these matters have to be assessed. We'll be, we'll be assessing these matters with the Minister's Committee on the Budget and Cabinet and saying now, as we approach the MTBPS, this will, that's, what, that's what we've been warning. And again, important here for us that we continue bringing this to, to the attention of this committee as we approach the budget. The other challenge is, uh, I mean, the, the other, this slide obviously is also an important one uh, where we have to look at the consolidated government expenditure by function uh, in the next few years. Um, learning and culture continue to take the chunk of, 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 the, of the allocations, of, you know, social, look at where debt service cost is. Not ideal. Actually, debt service cost is the total, you know, is, is more than what we spend on health, just as an example, over the next three years. And that's 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 very worrying. Um, and and we 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 have the view that this in scenario and situation must, must change. So a trillion rent over the three years is not ideal by servicing, and I'm just Deliberately saying a trillion because 916 is the same as a trillion, so that we we, we push this point home. Um, and then look at where health, uh, learning, and culture and, and interventions that we need to make on the economic side. So, again, this is a slide that we should not forget as we engage on these matters. Now, in the 2021 budget, uh, we, 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 we continued with fiscal, fiscal uh, consolidation. Um, and we painted the situation where it's becoming unsustainable. Our fiscal outlook remains unsustainable, and it's a drag on economic growth. Okay, so um, you know that that is that is important. We we are providing short-term support to the economy. This is not long-term, unless if we come up with long-term measures that will support the economy, we will not get out ourselves out of this challenge. Um, we are making in, in necessary interventions in supporting the poor. We've extended currently the, the special COVID grant, relief of distress grant, and the and the tears. And we started funding some public employment initiatives in this budget, but that obviously will not be enough. And then we had to basically play around with, with the same monies that we have, uh, literally just reducing one sector and increasing another sector and trying to shift money to productive sectors. Again, if the quantum doesn't increase, we'll be forced, continue to be forced to do this. And, and you can, you know, we, we, we committed in February that if there's one thing that we'll continue doing is to ensure that you provide enough for the vaccine rollout because, um, you know, um, if the, the more the economy opens back and becomes normal, the more the economy functions can, I mean, you know, economy can functions and we think more tax revenues will come. So we have put aside 10.3 billion, if you remember, to make sure that that rollout and contingency reserve is small. If anything has to happen beyond this, we'll obviously be in trouble. And at the time we did say that we're putting money aside for vaccine rollout. And you, you saw recently with the package of support that we, that we presented a few weeks ago, again, we had to, we had to, we were just so fortunate that you know the revenue performance was be, be you know uh, you know beyond expectations and we're able to have more to expand the social relief of distress grant and also to 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 um, to, to to support peace uh, you know to support security cluster interventions and give a billion rent uh, extra to the to the army and to the police in terms of new operations and a billion rent here and there for, for small business, I mean, for businesses as the support of the unrest recently. So 
But this, this, the inter those interventions obviously may not be enough, but this is what we basically have said at the time. Now, you know, let, 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 let's focus on the deputy minister spoke about this, and Sean will obviously talk a little bit about our further work uh, insofar as that is concerned. Strengthening transparency on procurement system remains an important issue, and we have to continue doing that. Um, the public procurement bill, you know, even in our team, amongst ourselves yesterday as Treasury, we were talking and say how critical it is that we have to modernize this in a way that we have to modernize it uh, we, without making uh, it difficult for, 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 for uh, public procurement to, to be expanded and for value to be derived in the way we procure and in the way we use state procurement as a, as, as, a, as, as a factor to support growth. Improvement of support of firms through the credit guarantee scheme. I think, look, it is something we, we you know, that credit guarantee scheme and, and, and the revision thereof is, is important. Um, and it's something that I think we cannot just throw, out, throw in the bin, but it's something that we need to continue improving so that uh, it can be accessible to, to, to everyone um, uh, and in a way that it just be uh, 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 inaccessible. Supporting household through the COVID grant, as I said, uh, in the meantime, it, 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 it was possible. Let me be a bit controversial, Chair, uh, as usual, and say, you know, the, the, the conversations and the requests and, and, and what everyone has been saying, and one expects that maybe we'll, this question is going to come out, are on the basic income grant. The basic income grant does not feature in this estimate, in this thinking currently. Uh, uh, you know, work obviously is underway. Uh, there's no commitment as yet that, uh, you know, that we got in terms of cabinet uh, signing off and saying there shall be a basic income grant and it will start on this date. That has not happened. But obviously the conversation is there and people see this COVID RSD grant as that. That's a different conversation and, and it doesn't feature as yet in our thinking per se, though as, as we can imagine, we are responsible officials, we'll obviously have to model the impact here and there and the social services team in the treasury is obviously looking at that. But you can imagine what this will mean based on what we're saying the estimates are. Empl implementation of tax employment incentive is some tool that we agreed to some time ago and we can take advantage of this and create more opportunities for employment. We have to implement measures to strengthen the public-private partnership framework and the revisions thereof, I must add, uh, because um, you know, it was relevant at the time and it, obviously a new source of financing emerged, a new uh, innovative financing approaches emerged, and our, PPP, our thoughts on the infrastructure side uh, will obviously have to uh, developments infrastructure development sites will also have to take into account uh, what the framework says and what the new thinking of the framework says. We can continue. We have to. I think where we are at as part of our mandate ensure fiscal prudence, including management of the wage bill, as I said, and ensuring value for money uh, when necessary. You know, uh, so that uh, departments, uh, you know, continue to ensure that the efficiency and effectiveness in spending of the limited amount that we allocate into them. Increase support to SMEs through more appropriate financing products and we hope uh, you know, the relevant departments are doing that. Support for distress, distressed state-owned companies will appropriate. And submitting that tough and difficult decisions must be entered into in terms of which entities should be, uh, should, should be, uh, you know, you know, um, you know, uh, you know collapsed or merged into, in, into one another, which ones, which entities should be prop up. We must take that conversation forward within government and direction we'll obviously get. And which en entities, uh, state-owned companies must close down. And, and it's not our decision as treasury, but obviously the government-wide, we will support where we are directed by cabinet uh, without, without, without favor, I mean, without fear of favor, but we'll also raise the challenges from where we see them so that cabinet in its, uh, in its wisdom can take co correct decisions on the future of state-owned companies and those that must be matched and those that must be disposed of. That, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's what we continue doing. 
the and that the work that our tax policy colleagues are doing to assess the impact of vet change on vulnerable groups households as we move across you'll remember that we did increase vet a few years ago and and how that impact continues to the pressure on vulnerable households and it's something that that our team should continue doing and and, and we have may, may have to have views around some of these taking into account obviously input from from various stakeholders within south africa What's important and what I think is also critical uh, is to facilitate access to savings for greater investment in non-consumptive public expenditure. And that balancing thing is something that we need to continue doing. And it's something, and, and the other thing, and final thing, by the way, which is a con con conversation and a, 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 you know, that, that must be had, is how then do we begin to use uh, source green financing uh, opportunities and green climate finance opportunities to fund a just transition. What do we mean by a just transition? What do we mean? And obviously, you can imagine our space will be to begin to think about issuing green bonds. And you can imagine if we are not, the conversation is not complete as to what type of green expenditure should these green bonds fund, then we cannot just put up a bond before we can even agree. So this is urgent, we understand that, so that all a just transition uh, mechanisms can be agreed and finalized. Finally, Chair, it's also then important that as these entities, you know, transit into 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 a green environment, that they are also supported. By the way, so this this for me is an important conversation, uh, and there are many players out there, both from international GFIs and local GFIs, who have got readily made money available. They want to make money available for green. Uh, for green for green type expenditure, but we have to finalize that conversation. And I know our colleagues in, in Department of Energy and Environment are on top of this, and, and that conversation is ongoing in various intergovernmental engagements. Chair, so I will stop here, and then I will ask uh, you know uh, you know Dr. Phillips to come in and just talk a little bit about the work that they are doing on Operation Bulling de la Front. And as we said, Chair, we can then. Uh, have a conversation later. Thank you very much. Th thank you. Tichi, can, can you yes. yeah, can you please uh, from your side allow um, uh, Darren to be a co-host, right? I don't yes. know if you're able to yeah, try to do it from, from, your, from your side because what happens if that doesn't happen, when National Treasury goes, that will be the end of our meeting where else that's not what's supposed to be. So there, yes. there was a an error that he made. So just try to make him a co-host. Okay, so I'll do that. Okay. okay. You know, uh, Dr. Phillips, come in. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, um, Chairperson, and good morning, members, um, Deputy Minister, DG, and colleagues. Um, I think uh, I'll try and share my screen from my side. Oh, it's uh, the host, Ms. Ferret. Didi, can you share my presentation? We can we can hear you, Dr. Phillips. Yes, I I can't share my presentation from my side. It needs to be shared by the host. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Can you make it full screen, please, DJ? Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, provide some more detailed uh, information to the introduction done by the Deputy Minister. Um, Operation Volendele is a delivery unit approach to support Cabinet and the President to accelerate the implementation of priority structural reforms. Um, and the aim of the initiative is to address key structural constraints to growth, such as shortages um, of electricity, spectrum and skills, and bottlenecks and delays in the ports. It's important to note that it's not another new plan. Um, it, it's, it's about effective implementation of reforms approved by cabinet, including some of the reforms in the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. So Operation Volendele is not a new plan. It's just about implementation, implementation, implementation of existing plans, 
as far as they relate to structural reforms. Another key um, aspect of Operation Volendlele is that it's deliberately not comprehensive and we're focusing on a limited number of high impact reforms to revive economic growth. Some, and this is informed by an assessment of previous initiatives such as Operation Pagisa and the Outcomes Approach, which also try to take a delivery unit approach, but uh, our assessment is that they didn't do as well as they could have done because they would try to be too comprehensive and so too many issues were focused on and because of that, not enough progress was made on individual issues. So we've changed and we've decided to focus on a limited number of key issues so that our focus isn't too dissipated and so that we can make progress on those key issues. Another very important point to note about Operation Volendlele is that it does not change responsibility and accountability arrangements for implementation. The reforms themselves are implemented by line function ministries and departments who remain both responsible and accountable for their implementation. This is a very important point, particularly given that that responsibility for implementation of, um, of the reforms is often, in, is often enshrined in legislation. And it would, it, it would be bad for governance if National Treasury or the presidency were to, were to start clouding those lines of responsibility and accountability for line function ministries and, and departments through Operation Volendlele. So I think for, for, from, from the point of view of Parliament, it's very important to, no, to note this, that um, it's very important for Parliament to continue to hold the line function ministries and departments responsible and accountable for the implementation of the reforms, because um, in, in terms of the governance arrangements, that's where responsibility and accountability lies and must remain. Our role as the Operation Volendlele Unit between National Treasury and the Presidency is to monitor, is to monitor progress and provide support or, or assist with coordination where necessary and to escalate challenges. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, Many of the reforms are complex and technically challenging and require specialist expertise and support to implement effectively. And we're finding that with some of the reforms, there are capacity constraints in some of the reform implementing bodies to, uh, with regard to that specialist expertise. And when we find that we, a role that we're playing is to, is to facilitate um, technical support to be provided to the reform implementers to address that lack of capacity. In some cases, we're also finding that there's policy disagreements regarding the detail of implementation of some of the reforms. And where that is the case, we're trying to facilitate that they be resolved with the reform implementers, or otherwise we escalate them to cabinet level for resolution. And in some instances, we're finding that, the, that some of these restructural reforms require coordination across a number of different departments and entities, and that coordination isn't happening. Um, sufficiently, and in that case, the presidency steps in and assists with that coordination across all the different departments and entities. The other uh, important part of our work is to assist the president and cabinet by providing them with a critical assessment of implementation progress, which is independent of the reform implementers. And to do that, we draw on progress information which we collect from various sources, including the reform implementers themselves, industry stakeholders, and sector experts. Um, as, as, as we proceed with Operation Volendlele, we're aware that many that departments and entities already have quite onerous reporting and monitoring requirements in terms of their APP and other reports. So we've been very careful not to add to the reporting and monitoring burden on departments and to avoid unnecessary and top heavy supervision of departments with regard to this implementation of the reforms. Rather, we've taken a supportive approach to offer support provide coordination where necessary and to assist with the resolution of policy disagreements where required. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, as I indicated earlier, we're deliberately focusing on a limited number of reforms to ensure that we make progress on those reforms. And we have 
On the basis of analysis done by National Treasury, we've prioritized reforms on the basis of the extent to which we think that they'll have an impact on economic growth. So we prioritize the reforms which will have the highest economic impact on growth. And in that regard, we're focusing on the network industries of electricity, water supply, um, digital communications, and also um, competitive and efficient freight transport um, and a visa regime that attracts kids and, and grows tourism. Um, and many of the reforms uh, in these network industries are also prioritized in the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Next slide, please. The government has made progress uh, since Operation Burundela was started in October last year. And that progress, for example, is, was illustrated in the president's State of the Nation address earlier this year, where he indicated that the licensing threshold for embedded generation would be raised to 100 megawatts that um, there would be a phase switch off of analog signal by the end of March, 2022. That's the analog TV signal, which needs to be switched off to free up uh, um, um, space uh, for um, uh, spectrum to be auctioned um, to enable an increase in mobile operation, mobile operated telecommunication services. He also indicated that the blue and green drop water quality assessments would be revised, that in order to address some of the challenges with, regarding, with regard to um, water resource uh, infrastructure and the supply of bulk water in future, um, he announced that the National Water Resource Infrastructure Agency would be established. He also announced that the e-visa system would be rolled out to 14 countries and that the critical skills list would be published, which it sub subsequently was done happened and that a comprehensive review of the policy framework uh, for attracting skills would be uh, carried out. Um, and then following uh, the State of the Nation addressments, there's been the key announcements. Um, for example, the President and the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy announced that the licensing threshold for embedded generation will be raised to 100 megawatts. And subsequent to that, revisions to, the sh to Schedule 2 of the Electricity Regulation Act were issued by the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy on 12 August and 20 August. This is a very important reform in the context of ongoing load shedding and the threat of load shedding to economic growth um, because it will enable an increase in private sector investment in electricity generation capacity without govern government guarantees and will reduce the risk of load shedding. It's the quickest way of getting additional electricity into the system because you don't have to go through a public procurement process because the private sector will be investing in the, in the generation capacity. And it's estimated that this could result in an additional 5,000 megawatts of electricity coming into the system over the next couple of years um, and an additional 60 to 70 billion rand worth of investment by the private sector um, into uh, electricity generation. A second key announcement which was made in June was when the President and the Minister of Public Enterprises and the Minister of Transport announced that the Transnet National Ports Authority will be corporatized in terms of Section 3.2 of the National Ports Act through the creation of an independent subsidiary with its own board. And since then, an inter interim board has been appointed uh, by the Minister of Public Enterprises. This, this reform is very important to address uh, the lack of efficiency and competitiveness through the separation of port infrastructure and port operations. Next slide, please. So my, the following slides um, cover the, the range of uh, reforms that we've prioritized, starting with reforms in the electricity sector. Um, what the slides do is they indicate what the reforms are, what the problem that the reform, what problem the reform is aimed at addressing, what we're trying to achieve through the reform, um, and what key actions need to be taken for the reform to be implemented. Um, you'll notice that I haven't included um, progress to date and timeframes for these reforms, because as I indicated earlier, Chairperson, in terms of accountability and responsibility and governance, the, the Parliament should hold the implementing re reform ministries and departments accountable for implementation of these reforms. However, as I go through the different reforms, I'll, I'll give some examples 
of areas where we're providing support and assisting with coordination um, with the reform implementing departments for these reforms to be implemented. So uh, one of the key reforms in the electricity sector is to increase the role of independent power producers to address the problem of the shortage of electricity and the lack of competition in electricity generation. And as, as Deputy Minister Mosondo indicated earlier, the um, uh, competition in electricity generation is required in order to make sure that um, there's uh, access to affordable electricity to all. Um, and the inability of government to fund investment in additional generation capacity given our financial constraints. The desired outcome of increasing the role of independent power producers is for electricity supply to be increased and made more competitive through increasing participation of the private sector. And there's a number of key actions which are underway, including the emergency procurement of additional power, the ongoing IPP procurements in terms of IRP 2019, and bid window five was issued and closed recently um, to lift the licensing threshold and embedded generation, which I've spoken about, and work is underway to enable municipalities to procure power from independent power producers. And the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy has, has, uh, has, gazetted, uh, uh, made, has gazetted regulations to enable this to happen. The second key structural reform in the electricity sector is to unbundle ESCOM into generation, transmission and distribution entities to address the problem of a lack of competition in electricity generation again. And it's very important to do this if we're going to have more competition in electricity generation to create a lack of, to create a level playing field for all the different uh, electricity generators to compete on. The desired outcome of this reform is to have a more sustainable electricity generation industry and, and to create an enabling environment for increased competition in electricity generation. Next slide, please. Of course, in order to reduce um, load shedding in the short term, it's very important for ESCOM to improve its maintenance and the performance of its existing plant. And uh, one of our prioritized reforms is for ESCOM to improve its energy availability factor on its, on its existing plant. Um, a further reform in the electricity sector is to address institutional inefficiencies in municipal electricity distribution management to address the problem of the deteriorating quality of municipal electricity distribution services and the lack of, in, of sufficient investment in municipal electric, electricity distribution infrastructure with the aim of creating a stabilized and reliable distribution system uh, at municipal level. And there are a number of reform actions that are required include the, the enforcement by NERSA of municipal distribution license conditions, the review by National Treasury of the municipal fiscal fra framework um, uh, to, to take cognizance of the fact that uh, in, in, in the longer term, it may not be possible to continue with a system where electricity sales is, are used to cross subsidize other municipal functions in the light of the changing um, changes happening in the electricity sector. And also to implement a comprehensive national support program to support municipalities to improve electricity distribution performance. And the city support program in National Treasury is working with metropolitan um, authorities on this uh, uh, reform action. Next slide, please. In the digital communication sector, um, there is insufficient spectrum available for network operators to provide high quality and competitive services. And there's a need to increase available spectrum. Um, and in that regard, the key, the key reform action is to hold the spectrum auction and to finalize it and allocate additional spectrum. Um, part of the process of allocating additional spectrum is to free up some of the spectrum which is currently being used by analog TV. And in that, in that regard, a key reform action is to finalize the analog to digital migration process with TV so that that spectrum can be used for um, for uh, other digital communications. Um, while making more spectrum available um, is a desired objective, it's important also that once that spectrum is available, that the um, network operators are, are able to roll out additional um, digital communications infrastructure as rapidly as possible 
And in that regard, there's a need to, for the policy and policy direction on rapid deployment of electronic communications networks and, and facilities to be finalized. So that the difficulties experienced by network providers in rolling out infrastructures, fiber networks can be addressed. Next slide, please. The water sector, um, in investors um, have indicated that they quite often find uh, the processing of water use licenses, license applications to be uh, unnecessarily slow and that there are sometimes problems with the quality of the water use licenses issued. And there is therefore a need to improve the water use licensing processes. Um, in this, this is one of the reforms where we've been um, assisting uh, the Department of Water and Sanitation through Operation Bull and Lela, and we've facilitated business process engineering expertise to be provided to the department to enable them to complete a review of the existing licensing processes, uh, which was completed recently, and now uh, to assist them to implement the recommendations of that review so that we can have more efficient and effective water use licensing processes. Um, there are a number of interrelated reforms taking place in the water sector with the aim of addressing the underlying root causes of the challenges in the water sector. Um, these include improving the regulation of service standards and prices in the water sector. Uh, and in that regard, um, DWS is in the process of reviving the green drop, blue drop and no drop processes. But we are also providing support to DWS um, to assist it to develop a business case for an independent water regulator. Next slide, please. Um, one of the uh, reforms that is taking place in the in the water sector is um, to separate the policy function and the infrastructure management function. Um, for water at national level, much like the policy function and the roads management function in the transport sector has been separated between the Department of Transport and Sunroll. Similarly, there's a process underway to separate those functions in DWS and to create a national water resource infrastructure agency to play a similar role in the water sector to the role that Sunroll plays in the road sector. And the aim of that is to address the problem that there's currently inadequate management of source and bulk water infrastructure in the country and inadequate investment in uh, source and bulk water infrastructure. Again, um, we've, uh, we're working with DWS and have provided them with some technical assistance that they requested to assist them to develop the business case and legislation for the new agency. Related to that, in order to develop the business case, and the financial model for the agency, which is going to, one of the roles of the agency will be to enable a lot more private sector investment in water infrastructure, given the fiscal constraints. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to develop a financial model for the agency. And for that to happen, the, the raw water pricing strategy needs to be revised to provide certainty regarding water pricing for the financial modeling and also for investments by the private sector in agriculture, mining, and other industries. And uh, we are also uh, assisting DWS with that process of finalizing the revised raw water pricing strategy, which needs to be, the final uh, pricing strategy needs to be approved by the Minister of Finance in terms of law. Finally, in the water sector, we also, there's also a reform which has been prioritized to address the institutional inefficiencies in municipal water services. Um, and there, um, again, the city support program and actual treasury is working with um, five metros currently and, and planning to work with the rest as well. And then after that, to, to, um, to take the program out to other municipalities to, to support them to, to implement comprehensive water business improvement programs. Next slide, please. In the freight transport sector, I've mentioned that we've had a key reform to corporatize the Transnet National Ports Authority, which is um, in the process of implementation and interim board has been appointed. Um, secondly, to improve the efficiencies in the, in the ports, um, 
Honourable members will be, will be aware of the um, shocking statistic which was released recently that uh, the 2020 World Bank Container Port Performance Index Index ranked all four of South Africa's container ports in the bottom five of 351 ports globally in terms of their competitiveness. Um, and there, there needs to be operational improvements within the Transnet National Ports Authority and, and Transnet uh, port terminals um, and increased competition in port operations. And um, honorable members will be aware that the Minister of Public Enterprises has made a number of announcements in this regard uh, recently. Um, further further uh, in the freight transport sector, um, we've identified a reform to establish the transport economic regulator and uh, members will be aware that the bill for that uh, eco transport economic regulator is currently before parliament. Next slide, please. Um, again, in order to improve the performance of freight rail, there's a need to implement, to, to finalize and implement policy for third party access to freight rail lines. Um, to address the, uh, by enabling third party access, it'll increase competition in container freight transport, uh, which uh, will, both freight rail and passenger rail are underperforming in terms of market share and service standards. And in that regard, there's a need to finalize and implement the white paper on national rail policy by the Department of Transport um, so that the performance of both passenger rail and freight rail can be improved. Finally, uh, Chairperson, in terms of skills, I did mention that one of the key reforms is to improve the regulatory frameworks and processes for issuing work permits. Um, to address the problem that investors and industries find the process of, of obtaining a scarce uh, or critical skills work permit to be lengthy and onerous and sometimes ineffective at solving their short-term uh, skill shortages. And we know um, that um, as indicated in the ERP, the growth of many economic sectors is currently constrained by insufficient skills. Uh, and in the, in the longer term, the intention of government is to address the skill shortage through the education and training system, but in the short term, to enable economic growth to occur, there's a need to enable industries to bring scarce skills into the country um, as required, where those of skills are not available in South Africa. This is another area where Operation Volunteer is providing a support role. Um, we are um, the, the and coordination role. There's five or six government departments and agencies involved in the processes of issuing work permits, and the presidency is leading um, a process and chairing a steering committee, which is overseeing the review of these regulatory frameworks with the aim of developing more efficient and effective systems and processes for. Uh, work permits. Finally, the, the final reform is to implement the e-visa and visa waiver system to make South Africa more user, to make the, the process for foreigners attempting to get a tourism visa to enter South Africa more user-friendly, which in turn should result in a growth in tourism. Next slide, please. Oh, that's the end. Thank you very much, Chairperson. G. Anybody else? Hello, uh, DGDM. Do you still have another presentation? No, that's well, no, the end of no, no, thanks. No, yeah, this is this is the end of our presentation. Um, and we are more than ready to, to engage the committee. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you. Um, what did you want to? Okay, let's, let's see. Uh, on, on the screen name, um, it's, it's a... Um, <clears throat> Darren, are you posting? Just blue. Yeah, it was just was just saying blue. <laughs> the person, yes, uh, I'm I'm sorted, but now the the 
This this better. <laughs> um, think. Hey, is it okay now? Yes. Okay. Um, computer challenge. Then you are fine. Is it not so? Yes, I'm fine. Okay. But but now this the screen is just black. <clears throat> Okay, that's 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 fine. That's uh, uh, let's uh, D D M D G um, <clears throat> Dr. Phillips and, and the whole treasury team. I think they've uh, given us a picture of what is, is happening broadly in the economy, and then on the uh, on operation of Indiana, and they have defined their role uh, as far as the different sectors that are involved in uh, uh, operation of Indiana. <clears throat> I think that 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 helps us a, 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 a lot, DM, um, because it also sharpens us to ask uh, relevant questions when we meet these different departments. I think that's that, that's really helpful uh, that we are able to to know exactly what is expected from what from what department. Colleagues, um, uh, you know how we do it. Can I get indications of uh, uh, oral members who would like to pose questions to? Uh, to team treasury. Peaches. Lenzana. Honorable Lenzana. Peaches. Honorable Peters. Sonyana. Honorable Sonyana. Matapa. Dihale. Honorable Dihale. Matapa. Honorable Matapa. Anybody else? Um, I know Honorable Honorable Kaiso uh, has, has 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 joined us. He was having problem with connectivity, but he has he has joined us. Uh, Honorable Kaiso, you if you have got anything or when you come in, please uh, feel free to raise your hand. Let's start. I will I will start with uh, uh, Honorable Mlenzana. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, Chairperson, uh, colleagues. Uh, greetings, DM and uh, DG and uh, Team Treasury. Uh, Chairperson, uh, on a lighter note, you know, if it was not because of age gap, I would be calling you to order. Why do you decide to put on my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what 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 economists call it? Yeah, they, they call it a bandwagon effect. Okay. <laughs> no, thanks, Jefferson. Thanks, Jefferson. Jefferson, uh, let us start by welcoming uh, this detailed uh, presentation both presentations uh, by Tim Treasury. In fact, today's presentation, Chair, is more of a class. Uh, you know, you know, must say our politics then, we would say in each and every political meeting, it uh, tend to be a political class. So uh, this, this, this presentation is arming us and is assisting us going forward, particularly when interacting with these other departments, at least from now going forward, we would know what to do. However, Chairperson, my comment, uh, just Ukupatesa or OTM, would be that uh, having interacted with Team Treasury from 2019, and uh, listening and observing uh, their passion uh, towards uh, stringent uh, adherence to, to treasury instructions. And there's always a challenge with oversight. There's always a challenge to, um, around the uh, who is who, uh, because treasury is a department or ministry, just like other. 
so now you are all equal uh, before a uh, government. Uh, and then you are not seen as a senior brother to other uh, sister departments. Now, how, how then do you, at the level of the executive, realize the implementation of this good program? That is my question. Uh, uh, how, how, uh, uh, how enforceful uh, are your strategies towards this? Lest this become a rhetoric. Uh, lest this becomes a normal government program like others. Th th this is one critical issue. Uh, and, and then secondly, would be, as I said that, uh, uh, I listened carefully. Is there no way of prioritizing uh, as to what is it that should come first in terms of economic recovery in particular? Wherein you even assist even the departments where you say in a particular department, this should be your priority so that we don't end up uh, always uh, dishing out money where it doesn't fit. I, I think this program should also begin to assist us uh, in terms of prioritizing our appropriation, our appropriation uh, mechanisms, uh, so, so, so that we don't get a situation where there would be this one department When our room lens are now, yes, we, 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 we lost you for a, a second. Uh, just just to the point, the point that you were making. Okay, let, let me switch off the video, Chair. Okay, uh, yeah. I, I, I was saying, Chair, in the second point, how, how a, or is it not possible for treasurers to assist departments in prioritization so, so, so that we don't do normal uh, appropriation of funds? Uh, we do appropriation as informed by prioritization as by this current program. This is what I'm asking. Because look, Chair, you would have departments coming, crying foul to us as appropriations committee, saying there has been budget cuts, there has been that, there has been that, only to find that the actual uh, priority for that particular department or province uh, is not in sync with what is in our mind. Now, I was to say, for instance, as an example, you have a particular a province, DM, where uh, the budget implementation is skewed. About 70% goes to uh, human resource uh, in particular, and only 70% goes to capital. 70% is just operations, and even in those operations, largely, it's a, uh, you know, human resource, uh, bloated stuff and all that. Uh, but then, if there could be a way from the Office of the Treasury to begin to guide. Chairperson, let me stop there. And uh, as I've said before, uh, this presentation uh, shouldn't be a once-off kind of a presentation, particularly for discussion. This should be an ongoing kind of a discussion as we begin to implement this particular important program. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable um, um, Lenz. And Honorable Peters, please come in. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, I've got a very short uh, a question. And uh, maybe to start with the DM and, and DG and Dr. Phillips. Thank you for your presentations. Very enlightening, but worrying, I want to say to you. 
these are the type of presentations that really can give you sleepless nights. My question to the Deputy Minister, uh, uh, Dr. Masond, why are we as South Africa in all economic indicators being shown to perform so badly? What is it? What, where does the solution lie? What needs to be done to change the scenario? Because if you listen to the, 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 the latest uh, uh, unemployment uh, statistics uh, indicators, they show again that South Africa is literally a, a, a haven for unemployment. What is it that needs to be done? to change the, 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 the picture. And if there is something to be done, why is it not done by the relevant role players? And, and, and I, I would want to ask the deputy minister also, whether in the engagements with the presidency with regard to the performance agreement of the president and the ministers, is this particular information being supplied so as to make it possible that informed choices are made at, at the time of taking certain decisions by the president? And also in dealing with this res resolution of challenges in the implementation of policy, like a, 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 a Dr. Phillips has indicated in the Vulindela presentation. The chairperson, the other question is, the on slide nine, DG went uh, to great length to indicate to us the areas uh, of intervention, but I, I, I only want to focus on two areas, which is uh, point eight and point nine, where you are speaking about support for distressed SOEs. I just want to know now, as we speak on this particular day, the 25th of August, which ones, which SOEs, how many, and how much do they need? Is there already a beeline for bailouts? Because for me, it is important to know. Now, last week, we were informed about the situation in ATNS. We, we, we will soon be informed about many other situations. Yesterday, we had the, the land bank, and, and it, it tells us that there is so much challenges just from the economic indicators, the performance of the country tells you that even the, the SOEs are going to be in that particular type of situation. So I would want to know which SOEs can National Treasury tell us right now are already showing signs. I know you used to have a, 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 a dashboard where you indicate with a tra your traffic lights a, a, a legend where exactly we are with regard to, to some of these SOEs. And Jefferson, at times it will be good for National Treasury to share with us so that we already see those who are in amber, those who are in the red, and those who are already, uh, uh, I mean, we should not worry about. So, and also, uh, uh, Dr. Phillips, you spoke about a resolution of challenges in the implementation of policy. Where is the delay in making sure that the presidential SOE reform, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, presidential SOE council is operationalized? So it, that is something that we need also to know. Uh, uh, DG speaks about the increased use of sourcing of green uh, 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 climate finance to fund, just the, to fund the just transition. What happened to the green economy initiative? Are there any benefits that has the, the country has derived at this particular moment? Because the Department of Economic, the previous Department of Economic Development, now trade and a, a competition, was working on and had produced a green economy accord, which actually in, in, in involved the private sector, it involved a, 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 a community, let me say all the role players. In, 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 in the net leg. So it is important for us to know that. Chairperson, going back to this SOE ref, uh, ref, I mean, uh, issues, 
I think uh, Dr. Phillips spoke about uh, the agency for water, and 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 I I I think there seems to be proposals to create more state agencies. Once there was a decision to merge or or or, or, or disestablish some, where exactly are we with regard to this? Some of these SOEs that we just have that have got mandates that. Uh, transcend other uh, uh, policy departments or transcend other uh, uh, spheres of government and there is a clash of, of uh, uh, working relations. I want to indicate at the time there was an indication that there is a need for merging and reviewing some of these SOEs. The, under the Department of Energy, there was, used to be something called the, the Electricity Distribution Industry Holdings. That, it had offices in Cape Town, it had offices, it had board, it had everything. But because of this reform process, the decision was made and even taken to parliament to disestablish this particular entity because it was just not working. Municipalities were resisting it, provinces were resisting it, and, 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 and national had part this particular responsibility. So I think it is important that we hear what is happening with regard to this additional uh, 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 agencies that are being uh, advocated for. I want to know if there is any time frames to these uh, water and freight transport reforms. Chaperson, there are some plans, uh, uh, legislation, policies that have been in the drafting since 2005. And we are now in 2021. We are nearing the target date for our uh, vision 2030. And some of these are still in drafting phase. So I just want to know, is there time frames for these water and freight transport reforms? The, 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 the frameworks for these were done, uh, Chaperson, in your previous lives would know there was this decision about moving um, a, a freight from a road to rail Today, if you travel in many of our countries, I mean, throughout our country, the number of trucks. In fact, as we speak a, a, a DM, in the Northern Cape, Chaperson, where you are politically deployed, you would have noted the devastation on the roads that is caused by trucks that are ferrying off from Katu, Postman's Bed, Limeakers, through this to the ports. In, 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 in either Eastern Cape or Western Cape or to, 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 to KZN. And these trucks are actually creating problems for, 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 for many of our municipalities because they don't even have space for truck stops. It's unlike Bo Harry Smith, which were in any case identified as a, 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 a hub a, a for, 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 for this, a, a, what is it? freight uh, initiative. So I would want to know where exactly we are with regard to this. And, and, and if you look at, at, at uh, the PICC reports, there used to be even indications on when exactly these things should be uh, uh, happening. But for now, it doesn't even look like the PICC is still an issue. Maybe uh, at one time we can call the minister in, in trade and, and uh, economy, I mean, competition to come and tell us where exactly we are with regard to the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission. Is the transport and TPE turf issues resolved? Because some of these policies, Chairperson, have a bearing on personalities and not as, as a, 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 any particular challenge. It depends on the particular individual. It depends on uh, 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 my space and it delays policy implementation. There is now a big debate, Chairperson. I don't know whether to ask that question, but let me ask it because it is in the public space. This uh, a social security reform that speaks to the 12% contribution by workers for social security. Where in the consultation process is it? And that is my a final point, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Honorable P uh, Peters. Honorable Sonyanum. Uh, 
Chairperson, can you yes, hear I'm, me? I can hear you now. Yes, thank you. Okay, can you see me? Yes, yes, very well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, um, Chair, we welcome the presentation. It was really like I was in a lecture room. Dr. Phillips was really giving us a serious um, lecture um, on this one. We have learned a lot that we did not know before. Um, and we really appreciate um, that. Um, Chair, I just want to ask, um, or maybe just get understanding. Um, the DG spoke about the fiscal distress, right? And um, I understand what he's talking about that other countries are also facing what we are facing. But I want to put it to him that South Africa is not like other countries, uh, Chairperson. We're one of the richest countries in Africa. And I still feel that as a, as a country, as a nation, we are failing to maximize on our natural resources. And um, I feel like if maybe uh, more time was given or more focus was given, we're gonna be able to actually make more money in our natural resources. Um, on the, um, the, the, the issue of uh, revenue is less, but the borrowing is higher. This is very worrying, uh, Chairperson, like my other colleagues have said. Um, and every solution that they seem to be presenting to us, it's a short-term solution. And I want to ask the DG and the, the department, what is our long, long lasting solution to make sure that we decrease our debt and then we increase our revenue? Um, and just in passing, Chairperson, I just wanted to speak on the issues of the IPPs. You know, the independent power producers are still one of the things that give me sleepless nights at night because I am always afraid of the price fixing. And I still don't hear how are we going to deal with the issue of price fixing. What if these companies, these independent power producers, they do what the other people have done from the steel, from the cement, from the bread companies, where they've done price fixing? How are we going to deal with that and make sure that our people actually do not suffer or end up paying more because now you don't have a choice. These people are going to uh, uh, fix the price in a certain level and the whole country will be forced. Gandhi, when it was ESCOM, um, we were knowing that, okay, they will always do what's best for the country and not what's best for their uh, profit margins. Um, you know, I heard um, uh, Dr. Phillips speak about our water and then he made it like an example to Sandral uh, situation. Yo, Chair, please, man. Uh, yes, sir. please do not sandralize our water. Do not, because one of my fears is that we will find ourselves to be forced to pay for water the way we are forced to pay for our roads. I don't know how that can be. I understand we need to make sure that our water sources um, are up to the world standard, but do not centralize our water, uh, Chairperson. And then, uh, Chair, when the DG was speaking on the operational Bulindrela, right, he spoke about how the president will step in to coordinate the different um, departments. Um, and, um, you know, my biggest problem is that I think it's always been a South African problem that our departments do not have the, 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 the coordination among themselves. They do not, um, you know, we find them doing duplications because there's no cohesion within the departments. And I know Treasury will be like, but you know, that's not for, for us. But I think Treasury must find a way of making sure that the departments find cohesion because we can actually also save a lot of money from that. With that said, uh, Chairperson, the debt is 15% above the average, uh, above EM average. And then we failed to lift the growth as they say. Um, you know, the DG gave us an example that it's almost what, a trillion 
So if we did not have this kind of debt, servicing this debt, we will actually be having almost a trillion in our fiscal to actually be able to cover our th other things. So we need to find a solution, um, DG and you, Dr. Philip, on how do we reduce this debt of ours as a nation as quickly as possible. And then in closing, uh, Chairperson, I just want to say, um, can our gov I don't know how is this going to be possible, but can you stop auctioning our country's riches and resources? You know, everywhere you go, somebody's trying to buy us, or somebody's buying this, or something is getting chopped, something is getting sold to the private sector. One day we're going to wake up and we're going to even find our own nationality have been sold. So I, I request that. There's always of auctioning of our, our, our country's resources. There's always of selling of our countries must just end um, a, a chairperson. And we must find a long lasting solution on how do we move ourselves from the negative to the positives. Um, lastly, uh, DG, the contingency fund um, that uh, was presented here today, I still feel like it's too small for the size of our country. Um, our country is just too big. And my, my question to you would be, on a worst case scenario, worst case scenario, um, if, we, if, we, if we as the country can face the worst case scenario either by of natural disaster or war or a terrorist attack, we will be, we will be able to manage with such a small contingency fund. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Fanyana. Honorable Tikhale. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Hello. We can hear you, Honorable Tikhale. Please continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson, and greetings to everybody in the in the room. Let me join my in welcoming uh, the presentation by the Deputy Minister. Dr. Philip and all the team. Uh, Chairperson, I, I want to, to start with the, the rollout of vaccination of COVID-19. Uh, I want to applaud the department on this one because it looks like the budget is working very well when it comes to vaccination of uh, this, uh, when it comes to vaccination on this, COVID-19 issues. We received our vaccine and our immune system have been boosted and now it is even touching the lives of our children. When we are asleep, they are somewhere where we don't even know. And our soul is afraid. Now that they are, they are, the vaccine is touching them, then I think it's gonna assist them. And with the issue of electricity, Chairperson, everybody's assisted on this one. And DM, I want to touch on the issue of water in our municipality, in Polokwane especially. Uh, my request is that uh, please, because now this uh, program of Bulintela is going to, to now come into picture and try to assist our people, I, I will request that there be a strong monitoring because there's such frustration in this municipality. Uh, way back, uh, there were different, many different boreholes which were, were digged in different rural areas. And those boreholes were neglected. Now, the issue of delivering the water using the truck or trucks in the very same rural areas is now in the picture and people have been like, but what so call are you? You find an old person standing on the line waiting for the truck, the truck that cannot even come. Maybe this program of Bulindela must just come and, and assist. I know that the, 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 there is this program of bulk water that is coming, but in the meantime, can, can, can I don't know whether it's your responsibility DM or if it's not, then you'll be able to, to, to talk to, to our mayors so that they, 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 they make sure that they, this money assists 
the people, especially in the rural areas, the way it should assist them. I mean, if you neglect a borehole that can be well equipped and assist many people in that area at any time when they need water, and then you come up with a truck that will, will maybe deliver the water uh, once or twice in a week. You see, water is life, and really, there is just chaos in, in our area. Chairperson, I think this operation will end there. If it can be well monitored, it can end up assisting our people. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, uh, Tihale. Um, the, the colleagues uh, are, are listening. Um, Honorable Matafa. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, DM, uh, DG, and colleagues, uh, and uh, the public at large. Chair, let me join those, and from here on, we are actually wiser than before the meeting started. Chair, I will, I will speak on just a few issues. Uh, being, being the last one to take the podium really puts you in a risk of not having anything to say, especially when you are in a committee with uh, members as well as uh, ours are. So Chair, my, my input will focus mainly on the economic recovery presentation. And I just wanted to highlight just a few things that in my books, I think that are important in order to assist the strategies placed by the president and the interventions that National Treasury through the fiscus is uh, bringing to the, to the fore. And, and the first point, Chair, is on how we spend the little resources that we have. I think, I think for me, it is important that we are able to spend the little that we have wisely. Now, the DG placed on record the areas that are being prioritized in terms of the spending. Now, my, my interest would be on those particular areas that are earmarked for reduction in spending. Now, as, as we are speaking on uh, fiscal consol consolidation, I think by its nature, it also brings restrictions in spending. So for me, it would be very interesting to find out if whether there are areas that uh, the National Treasury has identified where cuts are going to be made in order to ensure that the little that we have is optimally used and for those areas that are of importance. The, the second point, Chair, which I think is important in assisting the country to turn the tide as far as our economic situation is clamping down on fiscal leakages. I, I know this is a topic that over and over again we are talking about, we are discussing but I fail to see meaningful efforts, Chair, uh, besides the amendment to the Public Audit Act. I fail to see what other efforts are being put in place and maybe the National Treasury will assist in terms of maybe outlining the processes or interventions that they are making in order to deal with issues of wasteful and fruitless expenditure. Because the reality is that, and, and this was confirmed by the AG, by the way, Chair, that these particular wastages are increasing year in, year out. So, so the question is, what is it that we can do in order to ensure that this irregular, wasteful and fruitless expenditure are nipped in the bud? Because when you are running a tight budget, it is important to ensure that each and every rent is used for the main objectives of the state, as well as the strategic objectives of a uh, society. Now, Chair, the, the second point that also speak to the issue of uh, fiscal leakages is on the topic of uh, illicit financial flows. Again, a topic that has been spoken about, that has been reflected on, but the trend continues. I, I I, I see with a heavy heart when uh, the DG, I think it was on slide three, where he, he speaks about the main budget deficit at about 
183 billion. Now, when you compare that with what the global financial integrity puts as a figure that South Africa has lost between 2002 and 2011, it's at about 100.7 billion rands, which is about 50% of the budget deficit. So maybe I think it's time, Chair, that maybe the committee receives a presentation on efforts that government is really putting in place to ensure that finan illicit financial flows are discouraged and nipped in the bud. Because if we were able to cap the amount that the global financial integrity has put, I'm sure that the budget deficit could have been somehow mitigated. I mean, uh, Honorable Peters uh, speaks about the level at which things are going wrong. On the same topic of um, illicit financial flows, we are put as number 13 in the world in terms of the country that leaks the most. And, and, and with the economy that we are currently running and the efforts that we, we are actually trying to implement, it is very important to ensure that each and every cent is, is accounted to. Chair, we, we, we speak on the revenue that uh, the state also needs to, to mobilize. So that part of the illicit financial flows is key, but that is at a higher level. At the local level, we have a situation which I think also we are not giving too much attention and that is of the informal and the small medium enterprises that are trading in the townships. Again, a topic that we always talk about, but no efforts are following through in terms of addressing the weaknesses that we, are, we have identified. We all know the contribution that the small and informal trade can put into the economy. Honorable Peter speaks about the unemployment rate that has surged. Now, if you go to the township, there is a thriving spaza shop business. There's a thriving informal sector. The biggest challenge is that these particular traders, most of them firstly, are not local. Secondly, I suspect, that is my view, Chair, that they do not even bank the revenue they generate through the sales and services that they provide at the, at the shop corner or at the street corner. Now, when they are not banked and not registered, it means that, again, we are losing taxes that could have been channeled through the, uh, the formal or commercial banking sector. Had this uh, particular trade has been registered. Now, for, for me, Chair, I want to, to, to challenge National Treasury and Cabinet as a whole that maybe we are weak in, in law enforcement. Because I think that, well, it might be at the local level where it's an issue of uh, bylaws. But I think for anyone who goes into business, it's important that they are registered. And for some reason, they are also required to account for the revenue and expenditures that they generate in their business. So for us to keep on speaking about this issue and not putting efforts behind how we can ensure that this sector maybe is regulated or there is proper oversight on how this sector conducts itself. And I think that chair was, was uh, covered very well by Honorable Mlenzana when he speaks about oversight. How can National Treasury ensure that some of the issues that we are raising here and some of those issues that the president put forward as interventions are implemented to, to the team. Now, in the same vein, Chair, maybe the question also begs. Speaking about small businesses, I, I, I just want to find out from Treasury, and maybe the DM will assist. What are the lessons that were drawn when we speak about the COVID-19 interventions, particularly as it relates to the issue of the uh, loan guarantee scheme. Because in the loan guarantee scheme, most black owned companies 
are lamenting the fact that either they were rejected or they were simply ignored. Now, the same companies also are also complaining about the effectiveness of uh, state-backed developmental funding institutions. If whether are they saving the mandate as envisaged by the mandate of their establishment, and if whether are they really contributing to assisting black owned, owned companies. Now the question is what lessons have been taken and going forward, is there a view that maybe internal state capacity should be uh, bolstered in order to ensure that institutions like these DFIs are able to provide assistance to these companies that the commercial banks will normally uh, not is, uh, assist. Now, in closing, I'll, I'll just state the, the, the point that normally when we speak of unemployment, we, we always look at the operational part, but the end part in itself is the aim of generating an income. Now, small businesses in their own right, it's when individuals have realized that probably the sector is not uh, able to absorb us in the employment space, but therefore let's create our own revenue generation opportunities by then creating these businesses. So I think that one other issue that we can use to assist our people from going down into the poverty line is through assisting their initiatives that they make in their own townships. So I will pause there, Chair, but uh, those are the few questions that I have. And once again, thank you very much for the presentation and the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Honorable Mat Matafa. Is there any other honorable member who I might have missed? Okay. Um, let, 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 let me add, um, obvious, let, let me join my um, colleagues for welcoming, in welcoming the, 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 pre the presentations. Let me just go straight to my questions. <clears throat> um, last week, we, we had a, a, a meeting with the, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. Um, so the question is, uh, <clears throat> How, how uh, close does N National Treasury work with the department? Uh, related to that in terms of monitoring uh, uh, DM, one thing which worries us is the question of underspending by de different departments uh, and, and uh, entities. And they do that under these constrained uh, fiscal uh, con con conditions. Um, and this is a perennial problem near in year out we find ourselves in this situation. So I just want, and departments are always having reasons why they, they understand. But again, they come to appropriations and complain about, um, um, <clears throat> and, 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 and complain about a budget which have been cut. So what can be done about that? That's a question. But related perhaps to that would be, can't we find a, a stick and a carrot type of an approach to that, where we uh, uh, departments which are doing things properly and so on uh, uh, are, are given a carrot and obviously those who are not uh, a stick of some sort. <clears throat> because as things stand now, irrespective of how departments perform, they know they're still going to get to their budget. <clears throat> um, this is my, my next question. Um, I think Honorable Matafa raised this one. You know, so much was said about uh, at the end about the credit guarantee scheme. And, and it became very clear, early, very clear, much early that we're not reaching our targets. And if you remember, every time uh, NT, uh, uh, appeared in, in, before the committee, we would always restrict this thing that, look, it, this thing is not moving, right? There was a reason why, there was a reason why the, uh, 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 the department and uh, the Reserve Bank came up with the credit guarantee scheme to try and, and de-risk, uh, if you like, 
uh, 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 loans. But with all that, um, 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 by the end of the year, we had about only about 10% of uh, the 200 billion rand uh, 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 credit guarantee scheme. Uh, and it became very clear to us that the banks do not understand the market that they, they were needed to, uh, to, to, to deal with. And we made some suggestions here that uh, why don't we try to use some PFIs and put them also in the scheme because they, they also give loans. Uh, and we even went further and said, you can even use the, the, the provincial um, uh, uh, DFIs who are closer to the people who also need this money. Uh, but none of those things uh, happened. So we got impression that perhaps there was a solution. But as I said, of the much spoken about 200 billion rand uh, uh, credit, gar credit guarantee scheme, um, which was uh, which uh, uh, was about 40 percent of the intervention that was uh, that was announced to try and jumpstart the economy in the light of COVID, uh, was never used. So what are we saying go going forward? Uh, <clears throat> because it's very clear that uh, uh, if we are going to do the same thing and, 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 and pray for the different outcomes, we'll be doing what uh, 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 Einstein warned us against. <clears throat> um, we, we, we also had a, a, a presentation, although it was high level, uh, from from National Treasury um, at the beginning of the week, <clears throat> what what is very clear, uh, Honorable Peter has spoken to this, is that uh, the, the picture of the SO is remain uh, uh, remains very bleak. Now my question is, uh, there are many strategies that have that we have agreed upon before, as as as, as government. For instance, uh, it was said long time ago that we need to start looking at the question of strategic equity partners. But what I've seen is that um, when they're still veiling the company, we, we wait, we don't go out and get those strategic equity partners where you can get money for the value that we are selling to that company, but then at the same time you benefit by a number of other things if you partner with a company which is in that sector. Uh, um, <clears throat> rather than wait until the, 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 the companies are on business rescue, then we start, we start running health scatter looking for SEPs. Why are we not implementing this one? Related to that, uh, again, it was a great long time ago, uh, it's more than six, seven years, in fact, I, I think even 10 years, where we agreed about the disposal of non-core assets and define exactly why we say that that asset is, 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 is non-core. But in disposing those non-core assets again, we're, we're saying that let's make sure that again, we're enhancing uh, uh, economic inclusion, broad-based black economic empowerment, the inclusion of, uh, of women, the inclusion of economies in, 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 township, in townships, the inclusion of, of young people, the inclusion of rural economies as we dispose non-core assets. I still have to see where any government department comes to uh, uh, to parliament and saying, uh, this is a strategy, we are disposing this, this is an asset, asset, and these are the objectives that we are trying to, uh, uh, to obtain. Why is, that, why is that difficult? Um, <laughs> the next question. Uh, one very important element of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan pronounced by the president on the 15th of, 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 of October is the question of, of localization. And we hold the view that that won't just happen automatically. Um, we think that the government should be on the forefront of that. Uh, how, how do we do that as government? With a budget of about 2.02 trillion rand in the current financial uh, financial year, we think that, and we think there are things that the government buys. For instance, if you look at health, you look at, uh, at, at education. 
there are items that we know that the government is going to, uh, to buy. Why don't we use that buying power as, as an anchor uh, to try and promote localization of our businesses? What's, what's the problem? Um, an example for sense, I think it, it's happening with the, uh, uh, with the, the vaccines at Kabeha. But again, if you, if you look at the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the Brasa factory in Denato and Niger, we were already uh, 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 manufacturing trains and the supporting industry around, around that. Again, there the government used its buying power to, to force um, uh, Kibela to go and, 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 and open the, uh, the, the, that factory and all those jobs which are coming with it. But I think we can do it in many other sectors where we are big buyers. We, we start it and Obvious when you do that, you, you are crowding in the private sector investment and, main, and, and a lot of, of, of activity around uh, uh, that main uh, uh, um, <clears throat> government activity. So I'm saying, um, without preempting the, uh, the public uh, procurement bill, but I'm just saying that where we use this thing uh, to say what we were the biggest buyers as government and uh, uh, you, you, you give a contract to a company to anchor the type of, 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 of manufacturing. It may be a few runs more expensive, but when you look at the, at, at the macro level, you are, you, are, you, you, are, you, are, you are creating jobs, you are ensuring that you are, you, are getting, you, you, are, you are getting the revenues that you need to economic activity around that. Rather than running after, a, 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 say something is cheaper, it's imported, but you are busy exporting your jobs, you are busy exporting your revenue. So uh, I'm then saying that on the ERP, which I think uh, I would say let's all focus on that. How do we use the budget to make sure that we, uh, we, uh, uh, we jumpstart the economy, make sure that there's localization? And another example is with the money that you spend on RVs, right? And again, you use that, you not just people who are around Johannesburg, South Africa is bigger than that, to incentivize them to be in these other areas so that we deal with this thing of congestion of, 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 of Johannesburg, Deben, and Cape Town, creating economic activities which are supported by government. And I just wanted to, to, to ask um, on this one that uh, uh, what does revival of blue and green drop, drop water quality assessment mean? In Kenyan language, and um, and say, and why is that important for the economy? One thing that you you you'll always hear all of us complaining about is the lack of skills in in in, in South Africa. But we we have sitters and we appropriate money for that. Why are we not getting the the desired outcome? Just to throw something again to, to the executive that you, you may want to consider. If you look at the, the, SO, the SOEs and their history, uh, uh, especially under the apartheid regime, these SOEs, amongst others, they were used to skill our, 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 our people. Why don't we look at, at that again? If you look at, at, at Transnet, look at ESCOM and so on, where you, you even give a budget from these sitters or from from government to say, uh, uh, to transnet, to say to, to Prasna, uh, once so many technicians, these people, they go, in fact, they go to colleges, but you find that they are not being absorbed anywhere. And we pay for, the, for that because there is money, for instance, if you look at CITAS, people who just train and then they are lost again. So is it something that you'd like to consider? Because I'm then saying that, let's start being practical in some of the solutions that we may be looking at. Um, perhaps uh, uh, following up on Honorable Mlenzan, he spoke about the question of prioritization. Um, <clears throat> I think our observation when it comes to that is that despite the pressures on, on the, fisc the fiscals, we as government, we still want to do everything at the same time. But unfortunately, all of those things, we do them half-hearted. Is there no other way uh, as government where we can prioritize 
what you call the high impact interventions, right? Uh, high impact interventions which are going to yield better economic results, better employment opportunities, right? Uh, um, <clears throat> and we know that that's what we are prioritizing and deal with that and do it thoroughly and support it thoroughly rather than giving half cent, half cent, half cent, and we find that the outcome again, it's a, a suboptimal outcome that we are getting. I think lastly, um, uh, Honorable Matafa touched on, 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 on this one. Uh, the, the, the question of illicit financial flows, uh, transfer pricing, base erosion and profit shifting. Uh, Honorable Matafa came up with, 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 with the number, but all what we know is that it's one area that um, um, has been identified as creating pickets, like some of the pickets, like leakages of our revenues. Our money is going to build economies of, 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 of other countries. And this is a sophisticated uh, uh, way of, of stealing money. We, we call it these, these, these big names, but at the end of the, of, of the day, it's where big business steal South African money and take it to other countries. But um, our concern here at, at DMDG is that we have never heard of, of a cogent strategy that government has come up with to deal with this type of criminal activity. Yet we are losing billions and billions of, of, of money through this type of, 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 of leakage. I think all our members, I, I'm tempted to say that very soon we'll, we'll have to invite National Treasury and SARS and just talk about these leakages that we, uh, we, are, we, we, are, we are looking at. Because were it not for these leakages, our fiscals will be at a better, at a better position. Um, unfortunately, when uh, uh, and I'm saying this is sophisticated crime uh, that is taking place here, where our monies are taken out of the country and they are being uh, 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 <clears throat> used somewhere else. So um, I think I would like you to co to to, co to comment a, 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 a DG on this, but just uh, uh, say uh, you must know that that very soon will request uh, your, your good selves and SARS to come and talk on, on this issue. So we may start uh, uh, preparing uh, uh, for, the, for, that, uh, for that meeting. Yeah, that's the end of my, my questions. And back to you, DM and that team. No, th th thanks, Chair. Um, I, I think, let me ask, uh, the DG and the team uh, to come in first, and then I'll come in last, and then you'll determine whether you're taking the second round of questions. But let me allow DG and the team to start first. Uh, DG, over to you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DM. Um, and all our members, thank you for the questions. I think they, they, they really get us to think um, I will not be alone, uh, Chair. I'm, I'm with uh, two colleagues who will also, over and above Dr. Phillips, who will also come in, Nongbuyo Guma, who's the Chief Director in Economic Policy, and Edgar Sishi, who's also going to come in. Uh, he's the Acting Deputy Director General responsible for the Budget Office. So they'll come in uh, after I make some inputs. Maybe, Chair, let, let me start from where you, uh, you ended. And you said, you know, you'll obviously want us to comment and you'll call us with SARS. It's, it's, we'll look forward to that engagement. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, we engage with SARS all the time. Now of late is worse because then the, the budget process is, has just kick-started for next year. So there are a whole lot of budget requests and they are backed up by some data, et cetera. Um, the capacity as SARS is an issue. Uh, over the years, many, many people, very experienced professionals, SARS, um, resigned or exited SARS, or, you know, they were fired in a very short space of time. And then that's what you'll hear, what the commissioner will say whenever he comes. And that has got a direct impact in terms of some of the leakages, but I'll leave that to, to when, when, when we have that engagement, because... SARS on its own is, is, is continues to remain a challenge despite what they are able to collect and despite the fact that they were also in some stages, you know, 
And the commissioner did come to this committee and indicate that the budget cuts and here and there we try to augment so that they're able to collect um, with little capacity they have, but that's going to be a focused conversation. So you're talking about half cent here, half cent there. If I was you, I would say tiki here, tiki there, you know? Uh, <laughs> it is tiki, it's small, it's not a half cent anymore. Uh, and that's, I think with this, I'm hearing you to say, the inroads that you have to make are small, we have to come up with a bigger plan uh, and how we approach the whole question of reprioritizing is going to be an issue. We will, we will certainly get get to 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 that. And um, and and Edgar can talk a little bit about that process of repro, which is a very difficult process, by the way. Green jobs, and you know, you know, Vuyo will talk about that in terms of what what the thinking is around around green economy intervention. In, I mean, uh, Sean can also speak a little bit about it. Disposable, disposal of non-core assets. And, and I, as we as, you know, you know, and, you know, putting this across, I was just thinking to myself, how sometimes it can be difficult in the government system for someone to say as a DG and saying, I, I want to dispose of this entity or dispose of this function and how difficult it is for some of the colleagues or department systems to hold, to hold back and not give data and then the approach that's needed. They have been identified here and there. And, and in some cases you find that the consultation that honorable members are talking about, and I think honorable Tronyana did mention uh, coordination and cohesion within departments, um, um, you know, because it's important. I, I, I'll give a, an example where for instance, public enterprises will have, you know, uh, outline certain certain disposals that are critical within the Denel frame and defense, for instance, to say, no, 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 uh, not here. And that tells you that at a consultation and question point of view, we have to find each other. So it is it is our, our, our approach, obviously, that leaves much to be desired. And and we have to we have to make sure that we 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 come with one common view as to what is that that's non-core uh, and what is that that needs to be disposed of. The, the future of state-owned companies is bleak, Chair, as Honorable Peter said, and in terms of wanting, I'm, I'm trying to get that list now to, to show uh, the, the list is bad, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, where many of the companies would, would remain in, 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 um, in, in the red category, none or even very few are in the green category and majority are, and this is from a risk profile, a credit risk profile that we do and that generates that, 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 that uh, you know, indicator that, that we use. I will try and get it and put it on the screen as some of my colleagues will be, will be talking to just now. Um, so, so we will, we, 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 we. and again, whether it deliberate or not, but I guess it's the process chair to actually wait until value has been eroded for some of the entities to be disposed of. Um, um, you know, one obviously would not know the reasons, but as a principle, I think we have gone beyond this that says when need, when necessary, strategic equity partners must be brought on board. Uh, and however, most of the equity partners will come in when the entity's finances have been stabilized, when their value for money will be realized, etc. But you, as you will see later, many of the state-owned companies that you're talking about here, the value from a financial point of view is not there. The, the, the asset may be there in terms of a few people left, a few uh, assets in terms of, uh, you know, you know, you know, non-movable assets. But the reality is that the finance positions of these companies lose much to be desired, and and that's where sometimes the challenge the challenge becomes. Now, lessons learned from the credit guarantee scheme are maybe things that we should not forget as we approach as we approach. Uh, this conversation around a, 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 a different loan guarantee scheme or credit guarantee scheme. You are right. 10% out of a possible support, uh, you know, package that we had put aside uh, of 200 billion, 100 initially and another 100, when no one, people were coming through, but many were, were obviously declined. The reality is that if, if based on the credit risk metrics that they are putting up, uh, and, and, and second is when people avail themselves and say, I want to go and get a loan and you, you can't, 
you can't force people. These are some of the reasons that were given. Uh, obviously, uh, you know that you know many people did not come through. Many people did not qualify in terms of uh, their ability to repay these loans. Should they be grants? Shouldn't they be grants? That remains remains an issue. Chair, you're asking a very important question for me. Uh, when you introduced your point around GPME discussions that you had with them, where many departments are complaining about the cuts. Let's ask the key question, why are we cutting? We come to you every year and demonstrate and kind of uh, recommend for you to approve the appropriation bill as to why we are approaching the, the budget in the way we do. We are cutting because of the same points I mentioned earlier. The choices that have been made require such that we have to make provisions available for new expenditure pressures when the economy and the tax revenues are not going, when you want to claw back on the debt to GDP and the spiraling out of control of a possible huge budget deficit. That's the reason. Now, on one hand, uh, we have to then look and say, departments give up those programs that don't make sense for this government, though that, you know, the, 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 that are not priority currently for this government. Stop doing those and do others. Because in any way, we cannot afford to not exercise some, uh, some reductions. Now, this reduction, sometimes we may want to have a uniform type, which sometimes doesn't help. But the reality is that if you have a 20 billion rent uh, wage bill pressure as a start, if you have a, if you have a huge, and I, and I was just going through, as one of the members were asking, going through my previous uh, slides that we have used in other discussions. Just as an example, Chair, the spending pressures that we have currently that necessitate that cuts should be exercised further. Wage bill, 20 billion now, today. Denel, to address guaranteed debt, I'm not saying you know it's enough, but this is not even to take Denel forward, but just to look at guaranteed debt, 3.2 billion. Land bank, at the time of the budget, we said they need 5 billion. The student debt in the NSFAS space that we need to take into account, 15 billion. The SANRAL, why SANRAL? Because of the, again, the policy choices. SANRAL has got a huge debt created by the GIFU program, non-payment of ETOs, 4.7 billion, 4.6 billion. Accruals and provincial accruals in the system, another 16 billion. And that list continues and continues, and it, it can be anything around and you know, 60 or so billion. Um, if we have to think about the pressures in the system. Now, with these spending pressures, and I'm not even talking about the spending pressures as a result of, 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 of the COVID, I mean, sorry, the response that we had, because we had to look for money for social grants, for Sasria, supporting business, uh, you know, the, the defense and the police, all of that, and, and support that we gave to small business. Now, when you look at all of that, in total, if you're looking at what, 100 billion, 105 billion, and we said, okay, we can reprioritize here and there. By reprioritizing, simply means, Chair, it's different language. It means you're going to have to cut budget, take from Peter to pay Paul. And, and it's not easy. It's something that we don't like doing. But because we are trying to balance, and someone was saying, I forgot, Chair, who, or, or Anaro Namatapa was saying, how do we spend the, you use the word little resources that we have. They are very little in the bigger schemes of things based on the need that we have. So Chair, the issue of, of approach to cuts has to be looked in that context where it's the choices that government takes and where we are at is, is about the, the, the payment and the salaries. Now, if I have to start with Honor Melanzana, which is raising important issues and I'll go back you know, like that. Our oversight and the role that we have to play, obviously we can only do up to so much. There's only 1,100 or so plus treasurer officials. And, and there's the, 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 you know, you've got the whole government system. We would want to be everywhere. Um, but the reality is that I think the day we have a very uncomfortable conversation about the role of each and every stakeholder in the government system, whether it's a DG, whether it's an internal audit division in the department, whether it's a municipal council oversight body, whether it's a provincial uh, oversight bodies, including national government, 
to answer questions like you're asking us today. The effective, and including accounting officers and the role that the law gives them, by the way. Because I've got limitations in law in terms of what I can do to a department or what I can do to an accounting officer. But there are provisions in law that the executive authority can take responsibility for. And are they doing it? Then we can leave that to each individual in the, in the room here to answer that question. If Mr. Godongwana is to hold me accountable, and if I'm not, what is they So that, that's a conversation that I think at some point we need to engage. Now, we, I jokingly say, Mr. Honor uh, Melanzan, I'm, I'm saying, I jokingly say to colleagues, we are not the same. You and I are not the same. My, the, my counterparts in national departments. And then, you know, but I, and I say not because I, I think I'm, you know, there's, I say it with all the humility and not in a big headed way. I'm saying to you, there's a difference between us and you. We, number one, uh, you are, every one of you of 39 DGs, you write to me to ask for approval for ABC, and I approve. So that mood puts me somewhere, but jokingly I say to you, but we, we, the role is there. And I think it's a call that I think we have in a very humble way, we need to make to the counterparts that as much as we are the same, but the system should allow the national treasury to play the role that it plays what the law gives them. And in that way, with all the humility and not big headedness, we have to perform that role. And, and that distinction must be there. How we do that would remain a challenge moving forward. And I'm just saying this because you mentioned it, that we are not a normal department like others. And our role obviously has to be demonstrated as such. And the kind of uh, people we employ uh, and the skills base that we need as a treasury also is something that we continuously have to look at and ensure that we've got what it takes to become this department that has to be what it is in, in, in terms of, we may be any the same, we may be the same, but however, the reality is that our role obviously is, is, is elevated in a particular way and it's all given in law. Where something has to happen, it has to be concurrent to the Minister of Finance. Something happens, the Minister of Tax Policy, we decide and we recommend to come. So, so our role is very critical in exercising that role. And I tell this to my colleagues permanently, every time in a meeting, they, we have to be humble. We don't have to be big headed uh, and think that because the law says, you know, there shall be a national treasury that you think you are the, no, it, it, it's not right. But the reality is that the system should allow us to perform a function and relate as such. In that way, we think we can then be effective in our operations, uh, including in assisting departments in their prioritization. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. We may not do it 100% well, but it is possible because we've got fora that we start. We started now functional group meetings where chief directors in public finance will sit with departments and engage at the level of the technical committee for finance where I sit with my team with the heads of treasuries of other provinces we, 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 we are doing this thing in terms of assisting the process. But again, uh, the, you know, the Office of the Treasury can only guide up to a point. We will certainly need the support of all the stakeholders, as I say, and recognizing the role that we have to play. Honor Peters is quite you know, correct. And, and I'm happy, each, each one, uh, Chair, I've got each member who raised issues here, it was more than a page. I mean, uh, this is a very interesting and, and very productive meeting today. So Honor Peters is raising things that for me are critical. We have been talking about SOCs forever. And, he, and, and she's right, uh, she's right in terms, of, uh, in, terms of, in terms of the entities. Almost all the entities that we look after, um, you know, uh, and, and I've got them here, uh, you know, these entities, um, it, it is worrying, and I'm reading them from my, from, from, I just asked one of the chief DGs responsible for us and liabilities, send this agently, send this to me. Peter's dashboard suggests that, and I'll just read them from here. South African Express, ESCOM, SAA, Land Bank, Denel, just as an example, all of them are in the red for various reasons. The EMBA, which is a bit, you know, risky, we've got DBSA, IDC, Central, Transnet. TCTA is in that space. Green, there's nothing. And uh, credit ex risk exposure from social security funds. SASRIA is exposed. It's not in the green, it's in the ember. 
the compensation fund is in the ember. And then you've got who is in the red from a social security fund point of view. UIF is in the red, RF is in the red. So this tells you it's just a dashboard. You can make this available to the committee at a later stage. So it tells you, Honorable Peters, that as much as things are deteriorating for the worse from where we are a few years ago. So, and again, it is it is not a worrying, it is not a worrying factor. So the same issue that you raised around the, you gave an example about EDI holdings and what we're talking about. Again, you know, with relevant entities and departments, we can we can we can come with that. The and and, and maybe Vuyo or even Edgar can talk more about the issue that you raised about the green the green energy accord and the environment, and maybe even Sean. You you asked Honorable Peters about the social security reform. Where is it? Um, we did issue a statement, and I did not want to enter into a cat fight with my counterpart, Linton Tunu, in, in social development. But all we are saying is that the conversations is incomplete. Uh, it's the paper is the green paper, it's a discussion paper. Uh, and then obviously it has got huge implications in the space that we are, you know, the, in the space that we, we play in, which is around tax and tax policy. Because once you put up something like that, when the conversation is not concluded, you obviously tend to, and that's where we responded. We said, look, we, we have not finalized. This matter still has not discussed, discussed in cabinet. It is still at net lag, and I think the conversation is there. And your question simply was that, where is it? Uh, the last we, we, we were engaging with, it's in net lag. And, and I hope once that final paper is discussed, it will come through to cabinet's attention and we can deal with it, with it at, that, at that point. Uh, but however, it's not that we don't know about it. It's there. We know we have made some inputs as part of building this paper, and it will soon hopefully go to cabinet. And then the Department of Social Development is responsible for that. Honorable Flo Flo Floriana is right. You know, we, we are not like any other country. We've got all what it takes for us. We, we can be the best in the emerging world. We can continue the best, be the best in Africa. Uh, you know, not only in terms of the size of our GDP, et cetera, but there are certain basic things that, and those things are some of those things that, uh, uh, you know, Sean was talking about in his presentation, that if we do right, we can maintain the status. We can play in the big league of nations uh, in terms of economies that are not doing well, but the fundamentals we are getting wrong. And the fundamentals are all of the issues that this meeting has noted. And you give an example around a price fixing, illicit financial flows. And again, it's a conversation that will be more thoroughly dealt with if honorable members will allow that, you know, when SARS is in the room at the meeting that the honorable chair is re re requesting that we can deal with illicit financial flows and what interventions are we doing around those things? Uh, and, and the coordination and the coordination, we talk about it all the time, but I guess it's also the important thing around, you know, making sure that we don't work as in silos in government. In the system of government currently, Honorable Tlanyan, we've got cluster meetings, DGs clusters, economic clusters, I mean, cluster ministerial meetings, inter-ministerial committees, all of them aiming at making sure that coordination and cohesion is enforced. To an extent, there is success, but we can do more because currently we, we, we and where we are, when need where the law gives us authority. And sometimes I take my chances with my small little signature on our matapa to just sign when a department, for instance, is not paying their rates. I mean, Etegwini or Msunduzi or Twan is being owed by the National Department of Public Works for rent or rates. Sometimes I write a letter, but at the end of the day, it's that department that is responsible that must be accountable. So until such time that cohesion and intergovernmental coordination can only be enforced when we, and as I said earlier on, that as stakeholders, different stakeholder system work in, in, in functioning in that way, we are able to deal with the challenges. We need to find a solution to reduce debt. Edda will talk about that. I'll, I won't take, because Edda is, is, is in that space and he's, he's been helping us uh, with, with, with uh, you know. Um, stop auctioning countries' riches and resources. Um, agreed. I think we, we have to make sure that we, we play safe uh, in terms of not, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, the decisions that we take as government and the choices that we make and the recommendations 
as technocrats that you make to parliamentary, sorry, uh, you, know, uh, you know, politicians in the cabinet and the cabinet system should ensure that we, we take this, we uh, take that. By no means, the contingency reserve is not enough, 5 billion in a bigger scheme of 1.4 trillion. It is too small if something worse will happen. Now, there is provision in law and we, 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 we use it as and when things are very tough and we have not used it effectively for the reasons that it was established for, uh, but because we've been using it very cautiously, which is section 16. I think, um, you know, we can only be authorized by parliament, by you, in, 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 if there's a war of a, of a terrorist attack, natural disaster where we need resources and money to address those. When things come to a worst case scenario, the contingency reserve is not good. It was not enough when the floods in Durban, for instance, uh, when there were floods of two, two, three years ago in Devon, it was not just enough. So, so uh, you know, so I think the reality is that we have to be careful. But again, it's the choices. Do you put more money in contingency reserve vis-a-vis -vis programs that can uplift the economy? It continues to be a challenge. Honorable uh, Dikhale, you know, you, you touched a very sore point in, in, in my whole uh, working life or adult life which is what we see around issues about water in rural areas and in townships. And there are many reasons why that is happening. And, 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 and it ranges from anecdotal evidence that they're around sabotage of some, some, some providers, et cetera. But at the core is that our whole approach to water resourcing strategy in South Africa uh, needs to be finalized and agreed, whether it's water sub-provision in rural areas, in cities, small towns, rural areas, and townships is an issue. It's an, an ideal where people now in some townships in South Africa decided to just you know, have their own water pumps and dig down there, pay 40,000 rands and have water because the municipal water supplies are not, are, not, are not up to scratch and they leave much to be desired. So I think it's something that again, Chair, it's lifted in this meeting. The relevant department should be lifted. We can only make sure that municipal infrastructure grant is there only make sure that the water resources development grant is there. Its use remains a challenge in terms of the oversight role that the National Department of Water plays if there's a conditional grant and those people on the ground and the use of that money. So that's why I was asking, answering a very general question that if the system is functioning, it then makes it easy where we are to play our small oversight role as a national treasury because the provincial treasury will play its role the oversight in the municipal council will ensure that that water, uh, the, 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 you know, you know uh, resources are being looked after, the water pumps are being restored, are being refurbished, the maintenance, those areas around there where the water uh, works are in the municipalities are properly secured, et cetera, because of vandalizing and stealing of pipes of pumps and so on and so on. So there are many challenges that when we obviously have time, we can get into more details. How do you spend little resources? I did talk about that, Honorable Matafa, and I hope I was able to, uh, you know, you know, uh, explain uh, what we say. We and you did talk about revenue that needs to be mobilized again, illicit financial flows. That issue would come. We are doing a lot, by the way, in being part in dealing with illicit finance flows, and we'll talk more when the time comes. Our role in FATA, which obviously looks at issues of money laundering, etc. The, 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 our, our membership and participation in, in OECD, for instance, tax forum, where sharing of tax information can be shared across many other countries in ensuring that we're able to deal and we can unpack those. Thriving informal sector, again, it's a security issue. It's a local government issue. It's also a national government issue around, do we know who the traders are in townships? Are they registered? Are they tax compliant? How many are they? Where, where are their bank accounts? Do we know them, et cetera? In that way, we, we know. But again, it's something that uh, if there's evidence that suggests that these are, uh, you know, you know, the, these, uh, you know, uh, entities, uh, there's something fishy about them, law enforcement agencies must come in. But one feels that the first point of call should be the municipal systems to, to detect that Dondo has got his puzzle shop does he, is he registered for tax? Where, you know, is, is the place clean? Health must come in, uh, you know, from, and, and all of those fundamentals. We seem to lose the fundamentals. I've, I've seen a situation in many a township, Chair, where a road reserve 
People just decide to put a stand there and leave. And the municipality is not doing anything about it. So if the system is not functioning, don't expect that uh, the other systems that should be natural will work. The challenge, we're taking the challenge that we're giving National Treasury and Cabinet around these matters. And I think the colleagues, uh, as part of the record of this meeting, will obviously have to engage with, with some of my colleagues on these matters and, and make sure that, you know, we, and again, we raise the issue of the loan guarantee scheme. I did respond to it about the effectiveness of, um, it, look, and, and we did talk about it on our piece of telezi around how to look, we look at GFIs and other non-bank agencies coming to the space. Uh, and, and again, it's, a, it's a, something that we'll continue to engage with as we modify this, uh, this loan guarantee scheme. Um, uh, and, and we should obviously be held accountable for the results. And we cannot take all the forever in coming up with a scheme that, that, may, uh, that, may, that may, may, may improve how business, especially small business, access loans uh, to, to uh, startups. And the effectiveness, of course, of the existing agencies, whether looking at CIFA, CEDA, NEF, IDC, et cetera, and, and how those can be obviously augment their processes in such a way that we are able. Chair, I know I speak a lot, and but I'm sorry for that. And it's, you know, it's my style, but <laughs> I will ask Buyo for two minutes and Edgar for two minutes before Sean comes in and the DM. Thank you very much. Buyo. Thank you, DG, and good morning to the chair and honorable members. Okay, there we go. Uh, DG, I think you've actually covered most of it. Uh, so I'm not going to say much other than to respond to the one concern that was raised around how do we ensure, let me get this right, how do we ensure um, that the things that we're doing, the high impact interventions are prioritized and that we're not doing things half-heartedly. And I think this is exactly where Operation Bulindlela comes in, where we've actually taken the high impact, high priority interventions from the ERRP um, and tasked Operation Bulindlela that can draw on the power that the presidency holds uh, in order to fast track these cross-cutting and extremely important interventions. So that was just the one point of clarity I wanted to add. And then DG, I think on green, um, we'll probably have more to say on this at the time of the budget, but this is an extremely important issue that we are currently seized with. We know we've noted um, the UN's recent report on climate change and its very dire implications for South Africa. We know that South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, are heating up at a faster rate than the rest of the world. We know that this has dire implications um, for our natural ecosystems and going forward for sectors like agriculture, which could be subject to very extreme weather conditions, drought on one hand, floods on the other, um, and also going forward to the extent that the rest of the world is shifting to less carbon intensive methods of production and then um, setting their trade policy accordingly. South Africa is one of the biggest emitters in Africa uh, and with very carbon intensive methods of production does stand to lose out um, in terms of its competitiveness. Um, and in terms of growing the economy, this can have very dire implications for our ability to grow going forward. Uh, so we're busy engaged with uh, both the UN and the Presidential Climate Change Committee, looking at solutions around a just energy transition, uh, but we'll leave some of these recommendations uh, for the time of the MTPPS. Thank you. Thanks, quickly, Edgar. Thanks, uh, DG. I'll just deal with uh, three things real quick. Uh, the first uh, question uh, I'm going to deal with is around the, um, uh, the issue of the long-term strategy of improving revenue and reducing debt. Um, let me start with the debt part. Uh, our debt has, as we indicated in the past, uh, um, um, couple of budget tablings, including the tabling of the special adjustment budget in June last year, increased quite dramatically over the last few years. We are currently sitting on a level of debt of about 80%, just under 80% of GDP. Or to put it in RAND terms, we owe about 4 trillion RANDs to uh, various uh, lenders around the world, 4 trillion. This debt, of course, attracts interest costs. And the cost of servicing this debt now runs into the hundreds of billions of rands. 
It is now the second largest item of spending and will soon become the single largest item of spending by this government. This year, we will be spending 270 billion rands just on the interest on the debt, uh, what we call debt service costs. Uh, and the debt service costs are a first charge. In other words, you have to pay them before you pay anything else. And this is, it's, it's, th that's why it's so critical that we address the uh, increasingly uh, difficult debt overhangs um, that we have. We have to ask ourselves, how did we get here? What caused this problem? Well, there's three things that I would highlight that really need to be solved, that caused the problem and need to be addressed. The first is the poor economic growth of South Africa over a long period of time. If you look at the historical growth trends since the global financial crisis of 2008, and you compare South Africa with other emerging market economies around the world, you'll find that um, on average, South Africa has underperformed other emerging market developing countries by on average around 3% of GDP every year. Now, 3% is a big number. Um, uh, 3% uh, in current, um, in today's uh, uh, prices uh, translates to uh, more than 150 billion rands. So we've lost out on a, uh, a global uh, growth dividend because of our own poor domestic performance. So we've got to change that. Operation Vulindlele is about changing that um, as well as, of course, our own initiatives within the budget to uh, reduce the level of spending that's driving the accumulation of, of debt so that we can eliminate the, um, the primary fiscal deficit that we have been operating with for many years. So that's the first problem we need to deal with, the growth problem. The second is we need to deal with the fiscal risks. And much of the fiscal risk uh, we've identified um, increasingly emanates from our, uh, our unaffordable uh, wage uh, bill, but also emanates, and this is very important because it is part of the overall prioritization debate in respect of government. And that is the fiscal risks emanating from public entities and state-owned uh, companies. Uh, Chair, you will recall that in in the 2020 MTBPS, we indicated that contingent liabilities of government are expected to reach 1 trillion rand by next year. And that is dominated by guarantees of the debt of state-owned companies and public entities, and at guarantees of various things um, in the system, but mostly those entities and state-owned companies. The, the need to address the financial distress, as the DG was indicating, in state-owned companies cannot be overemphasized in this regard. And because that is, that is a big part of what's, of what's hurting us um, um, as, as, uh, as a country. The third thing that we need to deal with and we consider we need to now seriously look at, uh, Chair and Honorable Members, is the issue around fiscal rules. And I make this not, you know, not, uh, I know that there's political debates around this, but I'm not going to get involved in that. Mine is just a technical observation, which is that we need to um, have long run rules in place that address the fact that um, uh, 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 government especially on the spending side, has um, allowed itself to prioritize everything and to deprioritize nothing. In other words, everything, Chair, unfortunately, is allowed to become a priority. Bills are brought to Parliament with a wide variety of things uh, uh, that, 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 that don't always necessarily talk to each other. And so what we need is we need to decide what is a high priority, what is a low priority, but also to decide how we sequence our reforms. And I think one of the things that will force us in that direction, uh, in my view, is around the issue of fiscal rules. 
But the final thing that I just want to deal, or the second thing I want to deal with is this issue of underspending by departments, which you raised, uh, Chair. And I think that that's, uh, that reveals the fact that a lot of the problems that we experience, Chair, are not really money problems. We've got problems of planning, management, and leadership in government that are quite significant. And that leads to this apparent contradiction between people saying we need more money to deliver services, and on the other hand, they don't spend the money that they do have. Capital budgets are a classical example of this problem. You see it in the municipal space. And I think that in many ways, the crisis that we are seeing in many municipalities at the moment, which is uh, sort of blowing up, is in many ways um, a, a, a story that reveals something that's been there for a while, which is that we don't necessarily have a problem. We have a leadership and management problem um, in, in, the, in, the, in the government space. And then the last thing I just want to indicate is that on the issue of prioritization, what I think we need is we need um, to understand when you say prioritization, when I say you, I'm talking about you know, the royal you. Uh, when we say prioritization, we need to define what we mean by something that's a high priority. And that, frankly, is a political choice. That's a political definition of what is a high priority and what is not. A big part of our role from a treasury perspective is to assist the executive and to some extent parliament understand the idea of sequencing priorities. The fact that you, you can have a variety of priorities, but how you implement them is about how you sequence them. Something must come first and then something must come second and third and so on and so forth. And the challenge that we have in South Africa is that we have a tendency to take everything and throw all of it in the pot at the same time. And we have to enforce this requirement. You must sequence the, um, 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 the, the, the policy priorities. One of the ways which can help you do that is by putting in place a set of key principles about what you want to do over the medium term and during a political cycle. And so that's very, very important so that we have that inform what will be a priority and how those priorities uh, will, be, will be sequenced. So Chair, I think I'll stop there uh, from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I don't know if Sean, you wanna come in again for a few minutes and then can can take over. Thanks. Thank you, Dondo. Um, I'm aware of the time, and uh, as you indicated, some of the questions should be answered by the relevant line function departments. But I, I just wanted to ask, answer your question, Chair, about the blue, green, and no drop um, revival. And the blue, green, and no drop, no drop reports were reports which were done by the Department of Water and Sanitation on the quality of water and wastewater. Uh, services provided by municipalities and the degree to which they're losing water due to wastage through leaking pipes, etc. Um, and these used to be made public up till about 2014, and they were an important mechanism for to enable municipalities to be held accountable for whether their water and wastewater services were improving or not. Um, and th this is very important economically because, as you would have seen in, in the media, Recently, poor water service delivery is, amongst other factors, is causing some companies to consider relocating from municipalities where service delivery is weak and is a disincentive to new investments in those municipalities. So uh, for those reasons, the Department of Water and Sanitation is, is reintroducing the public assessment and public issuing of the, of the blue, green and uh, no drop reports. Thank you. Um, DM, DG, do you want to have the last word? Ah, uh, not uh, honorable chair. Um, my last word is the DMs. Oh, it's easy. <laughs> no, I think DG and the team they've largely covered me, chair. Um, I think they've said a mouthful. Um, j just to add a few points. Um, to co um, honorable Lenzana. Yes, departments are equal, 
And of course, cabinet, when it exercises uh, its power, government function, it does so as a collective and the president leads uh, government. And he does play a major role in making sure that as uh, different departments, we do implement what government has um, committed to uh, both um, in parliament, but also to South Africa as a whole. And given the fact that uh, these structural reforms, um, um, it, it's a set of commitments that government has made through the president SONA, we found it appropriate to make sure that uh, as and when we put together these reports on how far we are with structural reforms. The president chairs uh, those meetings uh, with the respective uh, departments. Our role as uh, Operation Volunteer is just to make sure that we put together the necessary facts as well as um, possible solution from the point of view of support uh, to those uh, departments. Uh, so. And, and that's the reason why this initiative is a joint initiative between the president and the Department of um, uh, Treasury or Finance. Um, so I think the point that uh, Honorable Peters has raised, I think it was uh, partly or largely covered and I think it's an important point on why is it that the South African economy has not been growing. Um, and I think um, just to try to sum it up, um, it's the fact that uh, business is not investing. And even before COVID, uh, the business has not been investing and there's no business that will invest if there's no electricity supply. Um, and, and I think um, even before COVID, we had this supply side uh, constraints uh, on our economy. Um, so if, if you want, we're not supplying electricity as a government, uh, it's very difficult to retain the existing investment or attract new investment into the economy. Can you imagine a factory which um, stops because there's power outages? Um, it, it has commitment is to, to supply certain things globally and it's not able to do so on time because the production has stopped. And it's even worse that if you were to visit some of these factories, um, once the production line is stopped, the machines have stopped. By the time you restart some of these machines, certain parts are damaged. And some of those parts, you're not manufacturing them here in South Africa. You've got to um, import them from somewhere else. And production line is basically uh, stopped. So the supply of electricity is a very, very important um, uh, issue that uh, Operation Vula is seized uh, with. And I think uh, you will agree with me that uh, many of these SOEs, including ESCOM, they played a major role in the economic growth of this country. They dealt with market failure because um, when, for instance, um, before 1920, electricity uh, was supplied by companies such as Halsler, which were allowed, say, in the Transvaal in the 1800s by uh, Kruger to uh, build a power station to supply electricity. And those private uh, businesses that were supplying electricity, they could not cope with the economy. And the state said, look, there's a market failure here. Let's come in and supply uh, electricity. And, and it does appear to me that 
there is now a state failure in the supply of electricity. And it's for this reason that government said, let's also allow the private sector to generate its own electricity so that we supply the electricity, we power our economy uh, so that uh, it grows. Because like I said, this SOEs, they came in to supply um, uh, things that were imported for uh, the economic growth in this country, ranging from chemicals with sasol, steel, which was very Im an important input for industrialization in, into this country. ISCO was established and all that. And I think we, we, we all are aware that some of our, our SOEs, they're not only presenting a risk to our fiscals, but they're also presenting a risk uh, to our economic uh, recovery. So I think if, if we were to get um, certain things on the supply side um, of the economy, telecommunication, which Operation Vula is, is, is dealing with, the skills, uh, transport, uh, logistics. And I know that uh, some of my colleagues and, and, and uh, interlocutors, they argue that, no, no, the problem is it's also demand. Um, it's not just supply, but it's also on the demand side. I mean, I will concede that it is, of course, uh, uh, demand side issues. But even if there's demand for the things that we produce in South Africa, and we can't meet that demand because we can't transport them. Our logistics are not working well. Our uh, ports are not working efficiently. That demand won't be realized. Even if there's an internal demand in the country for certain commodities and goods, as long as we are not able to transport them so that you meet that demand, you, you're just not going to deal uh, with, uh, with this problem. So I think um, to sum it up, uh, my view is that I think we, through Operation Vulindela, we have prioritized certain reforms and we do think that if we're to uh, focus on these reforms and get these reforms right, we will be in a much better position to put our economy in a better trajectory. And of course, the structural reforms are not the only interventions that we are undertaking as a government as a whole, as government, the totality of government, there's a couple of things that uh, we are doing, Department of Trade and Industry through localization and trying to boost our local content, to boost our manufacturing. There's a couple of things that are basically uh, doing. But I think one of the things in my view I mean, having visited some of these factories, um, it's the fact that we do need to encourage our businesses to really invest in new technology, new machinery, because some of the businesses or factories, if you are to get, go and visit them, they've last invested in the 70s, late 60s, in terms of their machinery. And some of their machineries, they are, they are not energy efficient. And it's for this reason that they are consuming a lot of energy. And as a result, their production costs are higher and they can't compete with some of the energy efficient uh, locations uh, in the world. So I think these are some of the tough conversations that we are having with businesses uh, from the point of view of Operation Bulindela, that in as much as we'll supply electricity, we're trying to do our best to supply certain things but they also have a responsibility to invest um, in advanced uh, uh, production techniques, uh, improving their own efficiencies uh, so that we also optimally utilize the resources that uh, we have. Um, the question posed by uh, Honorable Tronian, I think Edgar has dealt with it. What is the long-term solution to the public debt? I think the long-term solution is economic growth. And it's part of the reason why we're focusing on Operation Vulindian. And I think Edgar and his team, they've also said, let's look at the, uh, the composition of our expenditure. Let's drive our I mean, our expenditure towards investment, in, which includes, by the way, education, because education, health, 
are a, a good investment, but investing in, in uh, SOEs that are just not um, efficient uh, is, is, is just not uh, sustainable. And it's for that reason that uh, we are looking at different ways of making sure that uh, if there are certain SOEs that need to be closed, uh, so be it, because we can't maintain SOEs that are not uh, posing a risk to our economy, they're also posing a risk to our fiscal framework. And I think the point about the social security, DG has dealt with it, the, the issue about the mand mandatory contribution towards the social security fund. Um, all I can say here is that money bills, including tax, is the responsibility of finance uh, minister, and we are participating uh, on this um, discussion on the mandatory contribution towards the social security fund. And I think the point about sequencing as well, it's important because the realization of um, uh, including the social security fund, you've got to think about, uh, pose a question about what are the preconditions for a successful social security fund? Right? And I mean, many of the countries that do have these schemes, they do have very good economic growth, which is uh, quite sustainable. Their employment rates are very high. And therefore, I think it's important to really sequence our policies and ask ourselves, what are the preconditions for um, a comprehensive, much more inclusive uh, social security uh, in our country so that we sequence these uh, issues uh, very well. We shouldn't confuse um, our aspirations, um, what we intend to achieve and what is immediately uh, possible. Uh, I think Honorable Defale, I'm fully covered by your point. I'm also covered by the credit guarantee scheme, which is the point that yourself chair and Honorable uh, Matafa has raised on the credit guarantee scheme, because the scheme was essentially an insuring policy by, by ourselves as, as government for lending. It was just a contingent liability for the state that uh, you'll have access to this loan. And if you default, government will be responsible for mopping up um, that uh, debt. And I think the DG has covered me uh, that there were demand side uh, issues that uh, made it uh, difficult, if not impossible, for the scheme to work because the economic conditions uh, did not set the right incentive for certain businesses to basically take up debt. Where you had COVID, uh, you know, there was, it was not rational for some of the businesses to basically borrow. But on the supply side, we do concede that the way the, the credit risk frameworks uh, that have been put in place by the banks um, also pose certain challenges for the supply of, uh, of, of, of those uh, loans. And I think the conversation on utilizing the DFIs for supply of these um, loans, and I, we, we do need to be uh, very uh, cautious as well that uh, in as much as we reform this scheme and allow DFIs, but we must also make sure that uh, we don't load the risks to the point where it becomes uh, basically free money and uh, we just dish out money. And if we say it's a grant, let's, let's, let's make it clear that it's a grant, but if we still treat it as a loan, um, a loan, someone must pay back that money and uh, you undertake certain risks um, assessment of the people who come to you for lending uh, the money. So I think we just need to be very uh, 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 cautious also in that regard that if we say that uh, DFI, they need to be involved, it does not mean that uh, the credit risk assessment um, will not apply because otherwise uh, it, it can become something else and it, it may cease to be a credit guarantee uh, scheme. And I think without um, um, speaking for the banks, I think we do need to appreciate that uh, 
They did some work, a lot of work as well, in terms of the debt restructuring for SMMEs um, in the context where some of the SMMEs could not uh, pay their debt to the, to the banks. And I do think banks, they did make some uh, payment breaks uh, for uh, some of the SMMEs. And if I'm not mistaken, to the tune of 33 billion or some, something there, is it enough? I mean, I'll be the first one to say no, it's not enough. We do need to do a lot uh, to make sure that uh, our SMMEs are supported because they are quite critical in the economic recovery uh, of our country. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, we've also taken notes of some of the points that uh, you have um, you have made and i think we will uh, always always as we always do uh, improve on the work that we're doing with the guidance and support uh, that you are providing to us as a national treasury thank you chair yeah, um, uh, masondo uh, dg and 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 uh, Dondo and the team, thank you very much. I, 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 I think we have uh, engaged on uh, issues of uh, national importance, especially around the economy of our, of our country. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll still throw these things at, at you at the end uh, for our next engagement. Um, um, the, the, the localization and government using budget and this buying power I, I think we didn't we didn't uh, address that uh, uh, let, let that be part cost because I think there's so much potential um, uh, even taking into consideration the, the public procurement bill as to how uh, do we do we do that you know, rather than allowing our money uh, to leak to to other to other countries uh, we we also spoke about uh, um, that what we complain about, one would think it's a prayer, the question of our economy and skills, yet there's so much money that we, 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 we budget for, for skills, especially through, through CITAS. Uh, in our next engagement, we'd like to have a, a better understanding, what is it that is not happening? Uh, we, we used an example, for instance, of our own institutions, which we can use using this money, um, <clears throat> um, taking what we can as, as OR will always say that uh, it's not everything that the, uh, the apartheid government or the enemy is doing that we must uh, throw away. Uh, looking at how they use these SOEs, for instance, to, uh, to skill uh, the, the, the population and to deal with the, 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 the problem of uh, uh, poor Africaners at that, at that time. So we, we need to look into, 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 into those things. <laughs> And I agree with you at, at the end, the question of the BFIs and credit guarantee scheme. Um, I think the, uh, the, the necessary risk management uh, tools should still, should still be there, um, uh, but I don't think that we should preempt and say perhaps they'll be reckless with this lending. They've dealt with a lot of, 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 of money, government's money before, and dealing with the areas which I always I consider perhaps is market failure. So, uh, the MI always make this 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 example. See, if you were to to listen to Kaiser Chiefs and Orlando Pirates fans, that they they'll be complaining. Why they're complaining is because the team is not winning. Whereas those uh, Morocco uh, or Swallows fans uh, aren't, aren't complaining. Chiefs and Pirates fans they've got different views as to who should play and who should not play. Those of us who are with Swallows, we were fine because we know we're going to play Paris and we we'll beat them. We need oh, chips. So, of course, Chair. We, we <laughs> Swallows <lose> there. <laughs> Thanks, we're back in the league. Eh? <laughs> so, the, 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 the point is people start making uh, views on these things when certain things seem not to be working. So, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's what one would uh, like to, uh, to emphasize. Again, I, 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 I also wanted to know how close you work with the PME, Department of um, Planning, Monitoring, and Eval Evaluation. Um, again, because we, we are saying 
perhaps an undefined role, but at the end of the day, you do also have to coordinate the role of monitoring what is happening to, uh, to, to your budget or the money that you give to, to, to departments. <clears throat> um, I think the, the, the question of, 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 of uh, prioritization and reprioritization and uh, as uh, uh, Edgar was saying, proper sequencing. We can't agree more with, uh, with you on that one, but we are going to throw it back to, uh, to, uh, to DM, to take it back to the exec ex executive and deal with this matter. Because what we see sometimes is that the executives, because the budget we deal with is not, which we always emphasize, is not national treasuries, but a budget, or Minister of Finance budget, it's, it's the executive's budget, uh, which you find that cabinet have, would have agreed on, on, on the budget. But you find departments coming again to, to us as the committee to complain about their budget, if you get what I mean. So, but when it comes to real prioritization and sequencing, so that you can be able to take this thing and say, these we have done, then we need to do this thing so that uh, we don't have everything in the bucket being a, 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 Attempt priorities. Um, I think you have touched on the question of uh, the energy, stroke, electricity security, which is very fundamental to economic growth. I, 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 I think that's 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 very important, and we will say as 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 this committee, and and parliament, that. Uh, Minister of Finance have been before us um, coming to argue the, the, the recapitalization of ESCO. So we'd like to say we as parliament we have done our part when it, when it comes to this matter. Then uh, we are then asking everybody else to complete the, the puzzle to ensure that there's proper energy security. Um, because when, when you come before parliament and ask for recapitalization, uh, you know that there's a lot of other things we should be foregone in the process trade off. Uh, so I think uh, the people of South Africa wanted to say the difference as far as it is, is, is concerned. So we say uh, there are other people and other arms of, of government who must complete that, 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 that puzzle. Uh, lastly, um, we've, we've received your uh, second special appropriation bill. Um, and obviously, it means we, we need to uh, to revisit our, our 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 program. As you know, national treasury government to intervene where it wants to uh, to intervene. But I think um, I'm representing everybody on the platform to say this was a, a really good en en engagement, and uh, and and DM uh, DG. It should not be an event; it should be a process. I think we should, uh, when we meet next time, we should be able to emphasize on the issues that perhaps were not emphasized today, but thank you very much. Yeah, then um, you are excused if you want to, but as a, 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 as a, a, a committee of parliament, believing in openness, ferrostroika and glasnost, you are free to, to remain on the platform when you want to hear what we are discussing, but thank you very much. NT, DM, Dondo? Yes, sir. So you, 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 you heard how we, we, we conclude that day? Thank you very much. Yes, I, I, we got that. And I think uh, the more discussions on the illicit uh, financial flows, but also how we can use the uh, public uh, uh, finances to boost uh, localization, which uh, are things, I mean, you will know, Chair, that these are some of the things that the uh, government is doing, designating certain uh, products uh, to make sure that uh, things that we buy are things that are locally produced, certain buses, certain commodities. So the designated uh, goods and services, um, it, it, I mean, it's part and parcel of, but I think we, we can have, a, if you like, a much more disciplined focus 
uh, conversation on that, including how we can use our SOEs to uh, generate uh, skilled people. I mean, if you talk about the transition towards the new energies, the energy sources, how does ESCOM, as it participates in that, generate um, skills that are imported for renewables? And, and how do we link that up with the skills um, uh, levies and all those uh, uh, instruments to support our skills formation in South Africa? I think uh, you, you're absolutely right. We need um, you know, focus and much more systematic and disciplined conversations uh, on, on, on these issues. But uh, thanks once more for the opportunity. We've taken notes and we'll be guided by you on when do you want us to come back uh, to those issues. We're always ready to come and appear before you and account on all the work that we are doing as a, a finance department. Um, so I think, thank you so much, uh, Chair. Uh, shall I also say long live to Moroka Swailus, our <laughs> team. No offense to Kesa Chiefs and Pirate supporters. <laughs> but that's, that's how it is. We we, uh, we 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 just celebrating our <laughs> our best performing soccer team, Muroga Swailos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, thanks, thanks, thanks. The MS, I told you now we we, we received your second yeah, special appreciation. Yeah. There's a protest on Swailos. Yeah, I can hear. Honorable yeah, Khale, she seemed to be protesting on Swailos. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. That is why I'm saying I'm quiet. <laughs> okay. No, that's that's fine. The am saying that we are, we 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 received a second special appropriation bill, and uh, we'll 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 definitely be prioritizing prioritizing it. Um. Yeah. But uh, once once more, thank you. We'll we'll definitely follow up on these things, and try to get another day for our engagement. Um. Honourable um, members, I think let's get to the uh, next agenda item, which is uh, uh, announcements. It's more about the revised program uh, in, in, in the light of what I've just said, that uh, we received a second special appropriation bill, which you must deal, which you must deal with SAP, so that we allow, uh, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> we allow government to spend money where it's supposed to. Uh, uh, Darren, do you want to come in? Yes, um, I worked on a revised uh, program for the committee. Um, I just want to share it. Jefferson? Yes, you can see, yes. Okay, so Chair, um, yes, so next week we are on the 31st of August, um, briefing by National Treasury on the second special appropriation bill. Wednesday, briefing by the FSP on, on the bill. Tuesday the 7th, briefing by PBO on the second special appropriation bill. Wednesday the 8th, briefing by Sastraya on the second special appropriation bill, Tuesday the 14th, briefing by the Department of Social Development, Wednesday the 15th, briefing by the Department of Trade and Industry, Friday 17 September, uh, public hearings on the bill, and then Tuesday the 21st, uh, adoption of the report on the bill. And then the meetings that we were supposed to have uh, next week, from next week onwards, in terms of our initial program that was adopted. All those meetings have been put out, um, starting from the 22nd with submission on the 2022, 23, of revenue. Um, on September the 29th, on 29th September, briefing by Northern Cape Province and its budget. Tuesday the 12th, briefing uh, by National Treasury and other stakeholders on the performance, the performance and termination of IPPN grants. Tuesday the 6th. We have uh, National Treasury on the second quarter expenditure. Um, but I think this is going to be first of all in terms of the expenditure for the next one. And then uh, briefing by the OT 
GPA and Thank you, Honorable, me yeah. Thank you, Darren. Honorable mem members, uh, that's the proposed program um, which is going to guide us uh, 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 going forward, factoring in the latest changes. Um, can I, can we agree on that, Honorable members? Is agreed, Chairperson. Okay, agreed. Any seconder? Supported. Yes, Chairperson, seconded. Okay, thank you, honorable members. The, we, that's, that's what's going to guide us uh, uh, in, in, during this, 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 this term. As you can see, that um, uh, the special appropriations have just sort of pushed things back, but we, we, we still think that we'll still be able to do everything that we had said we wanted to do. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. Any other thing, Darren, apart from the program? No other announcement, Chairperson. No another an announcement. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you, all members. I think uh, uh, you really engaged with National Treasury and we raised very important uh, 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 issues, uh, some of, of which are still going to make a follow up. Um, uh, the with uh, Darren and the whole management team of SCOA, thank you. Uh, but I think you noted these things that I would like us to follow up with the National Treasury and perhaps even with the other departments. So let's 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 have them so that uh, we don't uh, we they don't fall uh, into the cracks. But thank you very much, honorable members. This uh, brings us to the end of, of 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 this meeting. When is our next meeting, uh, Darren? It's Tuesday next week. Next week, next week, National Treasury on yeah. on the bill. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, honorable members. This brings us to the end of the meeting. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues.